This happened to me a few years back, back when I was in college. I never liked cities. Always felt crowded, too much noise, not enough space to breathe. So, I took up hiking, found some national forests a couple hours drive from campus, places I could ditch the crowds for a weekend. My buddy, Kellen, shared the same itch for open spaces. He was a biology major, built lean and rangy like a long-distance runner. Me, I'm more of the ex-football player type, good for moving heavy stuff, less so for 10-mile climbs with a pack. But we made it work. We'd picked out a new trail that late spring. Up in the Cascade Mountains of northern Washington, dense forest, old-growth stuff. Matt showed a fire lookout tower at the peak, promised some epic views. Figured we'd make a long weekend of it, camp near the base, then climb to the summit. First day went smooth. Weather held, the trail was steep but well maintained. We found a clearing by a creek late afternoon, pitched our tents, cooked up some freeze-dried pasta. Kellen, Always the nature nerd, I deed birds and plants while I messed with the campfire. Easy, quiet, that kind of peace you just can't find in a city. Night fell and it was all stars and the crackle of the campfire. I was drifting off when I heard it, a howl, distant but cutting through the still air. Kellen sat bolt upright in his tent. Coyote? I asked, trying to sound nonchalant. He listened, brow furrowed. Nah, too deep. Wolves don't range this far south, do they? Hell if I know, I mumbled. Let's get some sleep. But sleep remained elusive. I lay there, listening to the forest creak around me. The moon was down, darkness almost complete. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig made my heart jump. Finally dozed off, but it was fitful sleep punctuated by nightmares. Dawn came, and with it, some much-needed sunlight to chase away the shadows. Kellen was already up, poking at the faded embers of the fire. Something was bothering him, I could tell by the tense set of his shoulders. Come on, man, eat up. That tower isn't gonna climb itself, I said, forcing a cheerful tone. He managed a half-hearted smile, and we packed up, leaving no trace of our campsite. Back on the trail, though, I couldn't shake the unease that settled over me. The trees seemed closer, more oppressive. Sunlight barely filtered through the dense canopy, casting long, twisted shadows like grasping fingers. A few hours in, Kellen stopped. Hear that? I did. A low snarl, almost a growl, coming from the dense underbrush just off the trail. My blood ran cold. Kellen held up a hand, motioning for silence. We froze, listening. Another snarl, closer this time, followed by the rustle of disturbed branches. We exchanged panicked looks. Neither of us wanted to say it out loud, but the word hung heavy in the air, predator. I reached for my backpack, fumbled for the can of bear spray clipped to the side. Kellen had his pocket knife out, a pathetic little thing against what might be lurking in those trees. The noises intensified, the snarls rising to a cacophony that sent shivers down my spine. Then, a shape burst from the shadows. It was like nothing I'd ever seen. At first, my panicked brain registered dog, some kind of massive, feral beast. But as it bounded onto the trail, bathed momentarily in dappled sunlight, I saw it clearly. It stood on two legs, easily seven feet tall. Its body was lean, 
corded with muscle beneath sparse, mangy fur. Claws tipped its long, powerful limbs, and its snout was filled with a terrifying array of yellowed fangs. But the eyes, the eyes were the worst. They burned with a predatory intelligence, a calculating cruelty that held none of the wildness of a mere animal. Before Kellen or I could react, it charged. Kellen yelled, raised the knife in a useless gesture of defense. The creature batted it aside, its claws raking across his chest. He crumpled, a scream cut short as it ripped into him, a spray of crimson arcing in the sunlit air. Blind terror propelled me. I dropped my pack, turned, and ran. Behind me, I heard snarls, the crunch of bone and wet, tearing noises. I pictured Kellen's mangled body, and a primal scream ripped from my throat. I ran without thought, crashing through the underbrush, branches whipping my face. I didn't care. All that mattered was putting distance between me and that, that thing. I stumbled out onto a logging road hours later, scratched, bleeding, and utterly broken. Found a ranger station eventually, babbled out my story. They didn't believe me, not at first. Talk of shock, hallucinations, maybe even drugs considering my less than stellar college reputation. But then they found what was left of Kellen. The park rangers searched for days, but found no trace of the creature. The official report? Animal attack, probably a bear, though even the wildlife experts privately admitted they'd never seen anything like the carnage. They chalked my wild descriptions up to trauma. Maybe they were right. I went home a husk of myself. Dropped out of college. Couldn't face the normalcy of classrooms and exams when my best friend had been torn apart in front of me. Kellen's parents, God, I don't even want to think about the look in their eyes when I told them what little I could. They deserved answers I didn't have. The nightmares never stopped. Some nights it was Kellen's dying scream. Others the creature's feral snarls or the flash of those eyes promising a hunter's delight. Therapy helped, some. Meds took the edge off. But I never found peace. Years passed. I drifted from job to job, never staying in one place for long. There was this certainty in the back of my mind if I stayed put, it would find me. I started researching, digging into old stories, half-whispered legends from all across the Pacific Northwest, back through history. Sightings of hulking, bipedal creatures deep in the wilderness. Reports of missing hikers, hunters vanished without a trace. I pieced together a terrifying picture, one that the world at large would scoff at. Dogmen, some called them. Ancient, cunning, and far from the stuff of campfire tales. The search consumed me. Every spare scent went into gear, survival equipment, night vision, high-powered rifles. Kellen the biology major would have laughed to see me packing firepower. But I wasn't hiking anymore, I was hunting. I tracked rumors across borders Oregon, Idaho even rumors in Canada. Learn to spot the signs, mangled livestock, territorial markings, the telltale stench of something rotten and predatory hanging in the air. Got close a few times, catching glimpses in the shadows, hearing those predatory howls cut through the night. But it was always just out of reach. Delusive, like it was toying with me. I started making mistakes. The constant vigilance, the paranoia, wore me down. Jumped at shadows, fired at a pile of brush once, convinced for a split second those yellow eyes were staring back. 
took to drinking, not much, just enough to dull the fear, the constant edge of my nerves. I nearly got myself arrested in a small Montana town, raving about monsters to the local sheriff. They locked me up for a night, then let me go with a stern warning and a look of pity. Pity was something I was getting used to. Saw it in the eyes of the few friends I had left, saw it in the quick, dismissive glances of women when I'd try to build up the courage to ask them out. They saw a broken man, haunted by ghosts both real and imagined. And they weren't wrong. One evening, news reports flickered across the crappy TV in a rundown motel room. A string of unsolved disappearances in Glacier National Park. Hikers, experienced ones, vanished into thin air. Something clicked in my muddled, whiskey-soaked mind. This was it. My chance, or maybe my doom. Packed up my battered truck the next morning. Drove north with grim determination. Booked a room in a cheap lodge just outside the park boundary, close enough to hear the wolves howl at night. The next day, I went into the woods, armed and ready. This was different. Before, it was fear fueled by blind panic. Now, anger burned just as hot, a righteous fury for Kellen, for all the others, and for the shattered remains of the man I used to be. I wasn't the prey anymore. Days turned into weeks. I stalked the old trails, eyes scanning the dense foliage. Found signs, scat, unnatural tracks, the half-devoured carcass of a deer. The dread grew with each passing hour, but so did the resolve. Then, one misty morning deep in the heart of the park, I saw it. A massive shape moving through the trees with impossible speed and silence. I raised my rifle, heart pounding in my chest. For a moment, through the scope, I saw those eyes, cold, intelligent, and filled with ancient hunger. I fired. The roar of the rifle shattered the forest stillness. I heard a howl, but not the cry of an injured animal. No, this was a howl of rage. The next moments are a blur. It charged from the trees, moving faster than anything that size had a right to. I fired again and again, the recoil slamming into my shoulder. Scored a hit, I think, saw a spray of dark blood against the bark of a tree. But it just kept coming. I turned and ran blind, desperate flight. The gun was useless at this distance, so I tossed it, hearing it clatter against the rock somewhere behind me. Tree branches tore at my clothes, my lungs screamed in protest, but the snarls behind me got closer. Tripped, stumbled headfirst down a ravine. Pain shot through my ankle, but I scrambled up, ignoring it. I burst from the trees onto a narrow, winding road. A truck, old and rusty, was parked haphazardly by the side. I lunged at the driver's door, wrenched it open. A startled middle-aged woman stared at me in shock. I barely saw her as I shoved myself in, slamming the door shut behind me. Go! 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 I screamed, barely able to form the words through gasping breaths. She fumbled with the keys, then the engine roared to life and the truck lurched forward. I turned, looked back in horror as the creature emerged from the tree lean. It paused on the edge of the road, sniffing the air, its eyes locked on me. Then, it let loose another bone-chilling howl and bounded away into the wilderness. I slumped back against the seat, shaking uncontrollably. The woman, bless her, had the presence of mind to keep driving for miles before pulling over to let me catch my breath. 
She asked questions, and I stammered out some vague story about a bear attack. Still, the fear in her eyes was unmistakable. Eventually, she dropped me off at the ranger station. Now, I'm back in that same rundown motel room, staring at the flickering TV screen. The news is on again, more disappearances in Glacier, search teams scrambling. But I know they won't find anything. Because I know the truth, the terrible truth that the world will never accept. And I know that it's out there, waiting, watching, maybe even grinning with that monstrous, feigned grin, anticipating our next encounter. This happened to me a few years back, when I was a smoke jumper up in Montana. Tough gig, and I'd seen my share of bad fires, but it was honest work, good pay for a single guy fresh out of the military. We were a tight-knit crew. There was me, Ethan, a rookie like myself trying to prove his worth, and a grizzled old veteran named Hank who knew those forests better than his own backyard. One summer, the fires raged worse than usual. News reports echoed dire warnings, showing apocalyptic walls of flame turning whole swaths of wilderness into ash. We were on call practically 24-7, soot-smeared and exhausted. Then came the assignment to a remote blaze up in the Bitterroot Mountains, the rugged, barely populated kind of terrain that makes a fire crew sweat just looking at the map. We parachuted in an adrenaline rush even when you've done it a dozen times. The fire was a beast, crowning in the treetops and sending up thick smoke that blotted out the sun. We dropped in a few miles short of the main front, tasked with creating a fire line to slow its spread towards a logging town at risk. Days blurred into a grueling routine, cutting, digging, dousing hot spots. The heat was unbearable, the air barely breathable. You learn to appreciate even the foul-tasting water from our packs, to find a sliver of sick humor in the grim jokes we cracked to keep our spirits up. Hank had fallen quiet, though. Usually jovial even in the worst situations, He'd started muttering to himself, casting wary glances into the dense undergrowth. Something ain't right, he grumbled, more than once. We dismissed it as exhaustion, the stress getting to him. But Hank was no fool. He'd grown up in these mountains, seen things that made city boys like me turn pale. That night... As we huddled around a meager campfire trying to choke down protein bars, the first scream tore through the smoke-filled air. It came from further up the slope, a ragged, inhuman sound that caught through the crackling of the blaze. We were on our feet in an instant, fire axes gripped tight, adrenaline spiking. What the hell was that? Ethan stammered, his face mirroring my own terror. Stay close, Hank growled, leading the way, his weathered face grim. The further up the slope we climbed, the less it sounded like anything I could name. Snarls, screeches, mingled with the wet, tearing sound of flesh. When we reached the source, my stomach lurched. One of our supply drops lay ripped open in a clearing, food rations scattered. There, in the dim light filtering through the smoke, was a shape hunched over the remains of a deer carcass. It was massive, at least seven feet tall even on its haunches. Fur covered its powerful frame, matted, the color of dried blood. Its head was wolf-like, but the jaw was elongated, filled with jagged teeth. And as it tore at the carcass, it let out another guttural growl, a sound that crawled under your skin. Sweet Jesus, Ethan whispered. His fire axe clattered to the ground. The creature's head snapped up. 
Its eyes blazed yellow in the gloom, locking onto us with a horrifying intelligence. With a speed that defied its bulk, it lunged. Hank yelled something unintelligible, shoving me and Ethan out of the way. The creature slammed into him, sending them both tumbling into the undergrowth. A flurry of movement, flashes of claws and teeth, then Hank's scream cut off with sickening abruptness. Run! I choked out to Ethan. We scrambled down the slope, the monster's snarls propelling us. We didn't stop until we reached the fire line, collapsing against the charred earth, gasping for breath. The creature didn't pursue us. Eventually, the sounds of the struggle faded away, replaced by the relentless roar of the wildfire. Ethan was sobbing. I couldn't blame him, we'd left Hank to die back there, or worse. When the sun finally rose, we stumbled back to the site. No sign of the creature, no sign of Hank's body, just a few spatters of blood on the forest floor. We reported it as a bear attack, because what else could we say? That a monster out of a nightmare had torn our friend apart? Nobody would have believed us. Nobody could. I try not to think about what happened up on that mountain. Got myself a desk job with the National Forest Service, far away from the wilderness. But some nights, in the quiet of my apartment, I hear the wind whispering through the trees outside my window, and it sounds a hell of a lot like the snarling growl of that thing. And in my nightmares, I see Hank's eyes, wide with terror in his final moments, and the yellow eyes of the beast that ripped his life away. They debriefed us, of course, those emotionless, bureaucratic types who'd never spent a night in the woods. There were probing questions, forms filled out, muttered theories about rogue grizzlies and feral humans gone wild. My insistence that it was something else met with polite nods and thinly veiled disbelief. Ethan, broken by what we'd seen, quit the smoke jumpers that same week. I stuck it out, a stubborn sense of duty, or maybe guilt, battling the voice in my head that screamed at me to run. A year later, they sent me back to the Bitterroots. A controlled burn this time, but the sight of those mountains sent a shiver through me. The crew I was with, all experienced guys, picked up on my unease. At night, around the campfire, they'd tell the usual wilderness stories, bear encounters, close calls. Finally, someone mentioned the rumors. Heard there's something strange out here, one of them said, his voice low. Big hairy thing, walks like a man. Folks say it's been around for years, snatching livestock, hunters gone missing. I went cold. It was more than whispers, then. Others had seen it, or things like it. Locals, old-timers who knew the hidden heart of these mountains far better than any outsider. Think it's what got Hank? I asked, the words tasting like ash. The men exchanged glances. Maybe, one finally admitted. Or maybe it was something else. These forests, they hold secrets. That night, I couldn't sleep. I lay in my tent, staring into the darkness, the noises of the woods taking on a sinister edge. Was that just the wind, or something heavier moving through the trees? Every rustle, every snap of a twig, set my nerves on fire. When a low, mournful howl echoed from the distant ridge, I bolted upright, heart pounding. Had it been there that night, watching us from the shadows as we fled? That burn lasted a grueling two weeks. With every passing day, I became more convinced it was out there. The feeling of being hunted turned into an unshakable certainty, 
every creak behind me sounding like heavy footfalls. I became jumpy, short-tempered, my crewmates starting to avoid me. I didn't blame them. I was half-crazed, sleep-deprived, and haunted by the memory of its yellow eyes and the blood on the forest floor. On the last day, as we were wrapping things up, I wandered away from the group, drawn by a morbid fascination toward the place where Hank had died. The clearing was overgrown now, the signs of that night almost vanished. As I stood there, an oppressive silence descended, the kind that rings in your ears. Then the hair on the back of my neck stood on end. I whirled, and there it was. Not twenty feet away, partially obscured by the undergrowth, the creature was watching me. Same matted fur, same hulking frame, same malevolent yellow eyes. It tilted its head ever so slightly, like a predator sizing up its prey. I knew then it was over. There was no escape, no fighting it. All those stories of survival were just that, stories. Against this thing, death was the only certainty. Terror turned into a strange sort of acceptance. If this was the end, well, Hank wasn't the worst company you could meet on the other side. The creature stepped out of the brush, slow and deliberate. An unearthly growl rumbled from its throat. It was studying me, savoring the moment before the kill. I closed my eyes, then thought better of it. If I was going down, I'd look the bastard in the eye. Then I did something surprising, even to myself. I smiled. I thought of Hank, of Ethan, of all those whose lives had been cut short by this monstrosity. Come get some, I croaked, raising my voice above the roaring in my ears. It seemed to pause a flicker of something like confusion in those awful eyes. Maybe it had expected cowering, pleading. For a heart-stopping moment, it just stood there. And then, as abruptly as it appeared, it turned and melted back into the forest, vanishing with an unnerving silence. I was left standing there, legs shaking, unable to process what just happened. Had it spared me? Was it some sick joke? Why? I stumbled back to camp, some half-formed excuses already on my lips. But as I got closer, shouts and the smell of smoke drew my attention. A plume of black rose from the direction of our gear. Panic surged through me as I broke into a run. My crewmates were battling a wildfire one that raged with frightening intensity. The cause was all too clear, overturned fuel canisters, ripped fuel lines, sabotage. My mind flashed to the creature, the glint of malevolence in its eyes. Had it spared me only to wreak havoc in a different way? The aftermath was chaotic. The fire blazed out of control for days forcing evacuations in the closest town. In the official report, I filed under cause, I scrawled two words, unknown. Unexplained. The investigators shot me suspicious looks, but could find no evidence of arson. I knew the truth, but how could I tell them without sounding insane? I retired from the Forest Service a year later. Never went back to the bitter roots. Found a small cabin off-grid, far from any place that monster might roam. I keep a rifle by the door, not that it would do much good against that creature. Some nights, lying in bed, I swear I smell wood smoke, taste the tang of wildfire, and somewhere in the darkness, I hear a mournful howl that echoes in my soul. My war with that thing isn't over. One day it might track me down. And when it does, maybe next time, I won't walk away.
This happened to me a few years ago, down in the Ozarks. I'm Joel, and while everyone assumes I'm all about city life, I grew up in a tiny mountain town. Hunting, fishing, hiking, it's in my blood. So, when a friend got access to private land for a deer hunt, well, I jumped at the chance. The place looked perfect. Miles of untouched forest, thick tangled underbrush. We set up camp, and I headed out, alone as I preferred it, to scout good locations. That's when I felt it, a sense of being watched. I tried to ignore it, figure it was just that back-of-the-mind instinct. But it intensified until I couldn't brush it off. I froze, slowly scanning the trees. At first, nothing. Then movement. A massive shape, crouched low behind a stand of hardwoods. Too big to be a deer, the wrong color for a bear. My heart pounded in my chest as it stepped into view. Dogmen. They're just stories, legends, right? But this thing stood on two legs, easily seven feet tall. Its muzzle was long, filled with wicked teeth, and its eyes. Those eyes were eerily intelligent, yellow and gleaming in the twilight. Every instinct screamed at me to run but somehow I managed to stay still, to slowly lower my rifle instead of raising it. The creature tilted its head slightly, like it was curious. Then it took a step closer, another, each movement so slow it was nearly imperceptible, but relentless. I backed away, not breaking eye contact. Stumbled over a root, and my pack crunched loudly as it hit the ground. The dogman lunged. I barely registered the blur of movement. It slammed into me, knocking me flat. I scrambled to roll away, felt the heat of its breath sear my neck. I fumbled for my knife, got a slash in, but it was like cutting through tree bark. Somehow, amidst the struggle, my fingers landed on the trigger guard of the rifle. I twisted and fired. The sound boomed through the woods. There was a yelp, more surprised than hurt, and it was gone. I scrambled to my feet, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm. I didn't look back until I was at the edge of the camp, my buddy staring at me, his face white. What the hell happened to you? he asked. I saw the tracks then blood spatters and the leaves following mine. Get the truck, I said, barely able to get the words out, we're leaving. We told the property owner we had a family emergency, made some excuse about leaving early. Didn't even mention what I saw, knew he'd never believe me. Back home, I started digging. Turns out, the Ozarks have tons of dogman stories, sightings going back generations, hushed whispers in rural towns. The scariest part? I wasn't even the only one out there hunting that weekend. Local paper ran a story a few days later about a hunter who'd gone missing in the exact same area. They never found the body. I went back out to the woods a few times after that. Stupid maybe, but there was this anger building in me, a need to protect folks from whatever was out there. My buddy swore he'd never set foot in a forest again. Me, I guess I'm somewhere in between. I got better gear, night vision goggles, bigger caliber rifle. But every time I step into the shadows of the trees, that sense of unease prickles up my spine. One night, I was out there. I tracked enormous paw prints, just like the ones I'd seen that first time. Heard those same howls, echoing mournful and predatory across the valleys. I crouched behind a rock, rifle raised, waiting for the inevitable attack. But then it happened. 
Another howl broke through the night. This one was different, higher pitched, more frantic. And then another cry joined in, and another, all from different directions. The hairs on my neck stood up. It sounded like, a pack. Were they communicating? Hunting? I didn't stick around to find out. I retreated to the truck, hands shaking, mind reeling. Seemed like I hadn't just been lucky, back then. I'd been stupid. Cornering one dogman was terrifying. A whole pack? I locked every door and window of my house, knowing it was pointless. Whatever's out there, walls won't keep it away. It's a matter of time, a matter of the hunt, before I find myself in those woods again, face to face with those glowing eyes. That moment changed everything. It wasn't just the primal fear, it was the knowledge that I was woefully outmatched. These creatures, they weren't just animals. They were strategic, organized. They stalked, outsmarted and they had a chilling sense of tactics. I wasn't going to be some hero, some hunter who took out the monster. This, this was something different, something beyond what I could handle alone. I needed help. But who do you tell? The park rangers? They'd laugh. The police? They'd write it off as a wild animal attack or delusional ramblings. There was an online forum though, a shadowy corner of the internet where people shared weird sightings, cryptozoological theories. Felt crazy typing it into the message boards, felt a surge of desperation as I hit post. The first response came within hours, you certain it was a dogman? Details. Then another, Ozark sighting? Thought they preferred the Appalachians. You alive? Turns out, there was an entire community, people from all walks of life. Hunters, ex-military, even paranormal enthusiasts. They'd seen things, had their own run-ins, some just as horrifying as mine. And most agreed. These things weren't some campfire story, weren't a myth. Weeks turned into months. I poured over every scrap of information I could find. There were recurring patterns, sightings near cattle ranches, missing persons cases in rural areas, territorial aggression. It painted a picture of a predator, one that had somehow remained hidden from mainstream awareness a shadow species living amongst us. A plan started to form, dangerous and maybe even a little insane. My forum contacts, we organized quietly, pooling resources and knowledge. We scouted, tracking those monstrous paw prints, marking possible territory boundaries. We armed ourselves, not for an outright attack, but for defense. We were going to force a confrontation, draw them out on our terms. The planned centerpiece was me. Bait. I knew those glowing eyes would recognize me, remember the scent of my fear. It wasn't a pleasant notion, being the hunted, but maybe this time I could turn it to an advantage. The night we chose was cold, rain lashing down, blurring shapes and obscuring movement. Perfect cover. We set up a perimeter, a kill box in a remote clearing. I sat in the center, exposed and alone, every nerve thrumming. The wait seemed endless, punctuated by rustles in the undergrowth, sounds that might have been wind, might have been. Then they came. Not one, but three. Huge. Wolf-like silhouettes outlined against the rain. My contacts held their positions, silent as ghosts. The dogmen approached, cautious now, sniffing the air, their eyes fixated on me. 
Every muscle in my body ached to run, but I held my ground. The largest one crouched, head cocked, a low growl rumbling in its throat. It was testing me, trying to decide if I was a threat or prey. That's when the gunfire erupted. Flashing muzzles, shouts, chaos swirling around me. Two of the creatures bolted, a blur of motion disappearing back into the trees. The biggest, it stayed. It lunged for me, jaws gaping, a scream of fury tearing from its throat. My instincts surged, a feral need to fight or die trying. I raised my rifle and fired, again and again. The creature staggered, roared, but didn't fall. I scrambled back, emptied the remaining rounds. It howled in pain and confusion. I was out of ammo the empty rifle a useless weapon in my trembling hands. It was advancing again, each step slow and measured, a trail of blood marking its path. My contacts, bless them, they broke cover then. Flashlights blinding the beast momentarily, gunfire forcing it to retreat, snarling. It wasn't over, but for that moment, we were safe. We regrouped, checking for injuries. Shakily, I reloaded the rifle. We followed the blood trail. It led into a tangle of caves, disappearing into a blackness that promised nothing but cold earth and dripping rock. We looked at each other. Going in there, no guarantee any of us would make it back out. But we'd come this far. We had to know. To warn others, if nothing else. I led the way into the darkness, the echoing howl from before still ringing in my ears. We found it, hours later. Deep in the caverns, slumped against a wall, its eyes finally dimmed. We collected what evidence we could, for samples, notes on the cave system itself, and left it there a testament to a hidden world most will never believe exists. The aftermath is bittersweet. We have proof, hard evidence no one in authority can ignore. But at a price. Two of my contacts didn't make it out of those caves alive. The rest of us, we carry the scars, the haunting knowledge that what lurks in the shadows is far more terrifying than we ever imagined. We share our story, carefully, the proof, the warning. Most dismiss it, of course. Old wives' tales, embellished campfire stories, hallucinations fueled by fear. But some, a select few in positions of power, are starting to listen. There's talk of investigations, covert expeditions. Me? I still head into the woods, but I'm never alone now. We keep watch, we monitor, and we wait. We know they're out there, more of them. And one day, they'll come back. When they do, we'll be ready. This happened to me a few years ago, down in the bayou country of Louisiana. I'm Rowan, born and raised near New Orleans. Love me some good gumbo, a saint's game. But I also grew up hearing the old stories, whispers about creatures lurking in the swamps and shadows. Figured they were just that, stories, good for scaring kids around the campfire. This particular summer, my buddy, Luke, got it into his head we should go on a night fishing trip deep in the bayou. He swore there were catfish the size of gators in these backwaters. Figured, why not? Little getaway, catch some fish, it sounded like a good time. We loaded up his battered old flat boat with gear, beer, bug spray, that turned out to be pretty useless and headed out to a spot his granddaddy had told him about. 
place was miles from the nearest town, the cypress trees thick and twisted, their branches dripping with Spanish moss. The air felt heavy, still, like even the crickets knew to keep quiet. We set up our lines, cracked open a cold one, and settled back to wait. Hours passed, not a single bite. Figured Luke was full of it, like usual. But as darkness settled in, the swamp transformed. It wasn't just the croaking of frogs and buzzing of insects anymore. There were other sounds I couldn't place. Low rustles, faint splashes, like something large was moving through the water out of sight. Luke looked tense. He tossed back the rest of his beer. Probably a gator, he mumbled, but his voice lacked conviction. Just then, I smelled it. Rotten, musky, and far too strong to be a gator. I whipped my head around, peering into the darkness. For a moment, nothing. Then, about twenty yards out, a pair of eyes gleamed back, a sickly greenish yellow that didn't belong to any animal I knew. My heart jackhammered against my ribs. Luke, I barely whispered, get the motor cranked. He didn't need telling twice. But as he fumbled with the engine cord, a massive shape rose from the murky water. Seven feet tall, at least. Covered in coarse, dark fur, with a muzzle stretched long and teeth like daggers. It let out a low growl that made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. Dogman. All those stories suddenly weren't so far-fetched. It lunged for the boat, claws scraping against the hull. I shoved Luke back, shouting for him to get the damn thing started. I grabbed a paddle and whacked the creature as it tried to climb in. It hissed, eyes narrowing in fury. Finally, the engine choked to life. Luke gunned it, and we took off, weaving through the narrow channels as the thing splashed and snarled behind us. I caught glimpses of it in the moonlight, easily keeping pace along the swampy bank, its monstrous form etched against the night sky. We roared into a wider channel and dared to hope we were getting away. But what we thought was a log up ahead turned out to be another of those creatures, blocking our path. The boat slammed into it, sending us both tumbling into the brackish water. I surfaced, gasping for air. Luke was nowhere to be seen. Panic sliced through me. Luke! I yelled, thrashing around. Then I saw it. One of the creatures hauled him out of the water, his body limp, a horrifying gash across his chest. It turned those monstrous eyes on me, let out a roar that echoed across the swamp, then disappeared into the darkness taking Luke with it. I thrashed back to the overturned boat, clung to it for dear life as the current carried me further downstream. Every splash, every shadow seemed like those creatures closing in again. Somehow, as dawn broke, I washed ashore, half dead and covered in swamp muck. It took hours to stumble back to a road, flag down a trucker, get back to civilization. The cops didn't believe me, not even when I showed them the claw marks ripped into the boat. Chalked it up to a gator attack bear maybe. Said Luke probably got lost out there, his body just never recovered. I spent a few days in the hospital for shock and exposure, those doctors looking at me like I was crazy when I tried to tell them the truth. Maybe they're right. Maybe I am crazy. But I know what I saw, what I survived. Back home. I never sleep without a loaded shotgun by the bed. People talk about the dangers of the swamp, gators, and water moccasins, but there's something far worse lurking out there. And somehow, I don't think I was its first victim, 
and I sure as hell won't be its last. Nights when the fog rolls in thick off the bayou, and the mournful cry of a bullfrog sounds eerily like a howl, I barricade my doors, check the perimeter lights, and wait. There's always that nagging fear that someday, those glowing eyes will appear outside my window once more. After that, life was never the same. Luke's family held a funeral of sorts, but it was a hollow thing without his body. People gave their condolences, said he was probably with the angels now, but I could see the doubt in their eyes. That small town distrust of anyone who dared speak a truth that shattered their comfortable view of the world. They called me a drunk, a liar, said the trauma of the swamp had broken my already fragile mental state. Maybe it did. I started flinching at shadows, jumping at every dog bark. Took to sleeping with the lights on, a habit I haven't been able to break. His mom even stopped by once, begging me to stop spreading such awful stories. The way she looked at me, it was like I had killed her boy all over again. In the end, I couldn't stay. Packed up what little I had, sold my dad's old fishing boat that I'd sworn I'd keep forever, and left New Orleans. I drifted north, trying big cities for a while figuring maybe I could disappear, start over. But those eyes, they followed me in my nightmares. It wasn't until I stumbled across a website, hunters, ex-military types obsessed with cryptids, Bigfoot sightings, all the stuff normal folks scoffed at, that something in me ignited. Scrolling through their posts, I saw others, others who had fleeting glimpses, who were dismissed as crazy, folks who lived on the fringes like me. I learned there was a whole network out there, tracking sightings, swapping stories. Learned those bayou creatures weren't isolated. Up in the Appalachians, the northern pine forests. They had different names for them, but the descriptions were eerily similar. I wasn't alone, I wasn't crazy but that barely felt like a comfort. There were theories, debates about whether they were some undiscovered species, or something supernatural. We traded info on their weaknesses, silver bullets, supposedly, high-caliber rifles if you could land a lucky shot. All of it grim preparation for the next encounter. I started training. Target practice wilderness survival skills, anything that might give me an edge if, when, I crossed paths with those monsters again. The gun under the mattress got upgraded to something with more stopping power. I found myself seeking out isolated places, the woods and trails others avoided. Looking for tracks, traces, anything that proved they were still out there. Sometimes I wondered if I was hunting them, or they were hunting me. Years bled together. I never really had a normal life again, just a series of temporary addresses, odd jobs to get by. Hooked up with other folks from those forums occasionally, forming uneasy alliances for scouting trips. We never found a lair not a single definitive piece of evidence that would blow the lid off the whole thing, force those in their safe suburban houses to acknowledge the darkness at the edge of the map. Then, last fall, it came to a head. A string of disappearances in a national park out west. Hikers, campers vanishing without a trace. Rangers found scraps of clothing torn to shreds blood splatters, but officially blamed it on mountain lions. One of the guys from the forum, an ex-ranger himself, caught a glimpse of the real culprit on a night patrol. It was enough. We assembled a crew, eight of us in total. Armed to the teeth, with all the knowledge we'd pieced together. The locals thought we were just another bunch of survivalist knots. 
didn't bother correcting them. We weren't going in there to prove anything to the world, this was about settling a very personal score. We tracked those creatures for days, deeper into the wilderness than any of us had ventured before. Found their scat, massive paw prints, the half-eaten remains of a deer. Got that same feeling I had back in the bayou, that mix of primal fear and bone-deep anger. We set up camp near a ridgeline overlooking a thickly forested valley. They liked to hunt from high ground, ambush their prey. Figured we'd turn ourselves into bait, draw them out on our terms. Just after sunset, it happened. A low howl that made my blood run cold. Then another, answering. Not just two of those monsters, a whole pack of them. They circled us slowly, those glowing eyes flickering through the trees. We hit them hard. Gunfire echoed off the hillsides. Two of them dropped, but the rest scattered, moving with unnatural speed. We lost one of our own men, a woman named Sarah, dragged off into the darkness before we could reach her. Found her body later, ripped to pieces. It fueled our rage, even as the sickening horror burrowed deeper into our souls. The firefight went on through the night, chaotic bursts of gunfire illuminating those monstrous silhouettes. We held our ground, barely, until first light. By then, they'd retreated, leaving a trail of blood and carnage in their wake. In the end, we killed three of them got proof. First samples, photos of the corpses, the whole nine yards. We dragged the bodies as far as we could manage, left them in a clearing for the authorities to find. Figured the truth couldn't be hidden forever. This happened to me a few years back, when I was a park ranger in the Smoky Mountains. Figure that after everything, I'd never set foot in a forest again. But hey, the mountains, they have a way of getting into your blood. I got a gig running a wilderness education program for troubled teens, court-ordered kids, tough upbringing, the whole nine yards. Name's Lucas, Lucas Ward. The program was pretty simple. Take him into the backcountry for two weeks, teach him some survival skills, maybe knock some of that city kid attitude out of them. Most weeks, it was a struggle, but you'd see some sparks of change now and then. This batch, though, they were a handful from the get-go. Six kids, all with rap sheets and eyes that had seen too much too soon. I had another ranger along. Melissa, but it was still a tall order trying to wrangle this crew. First few days were rough. Constant bickering, two of the boys nearly got into a full-on fist fight, and they couldn't keep their eyes off the one girl in the group, making her real uncomfortable. One morning, I woke to find half our supplies gone, stolen or lost in the night, couldn't be sure. I chewed them out proper but inside I knew this trip was headed for disaster. Should have gone back right then. Ego, I guess, didn't want to admit I couldn't handle it. The plan was to hike them to a remote campsite, a good week away from the trailhead. Figured the isolation would force them to work together, or at least tire them out enough to give us a break. Big mistake. By the fifth day, Morale had hit rock bottom. Kids were whining about blisters, about the food, about each other. We were way off schedule, and a storm was rolling in, the sky turning a nasty shade of yellow-green. I figured we'd push on until we found a decent place to hole up, but that's when it happened. We were crossing a ridgeline, an exposed trail with a steep drop-off on one side. Suddenly, Kayla, 
the girl, screamed. We whirled around to see her scrambling back from the edge, face white as a sheet. What is it? Melissa yelled over the rising wind. Something, something grabbed me, Kayla stammered, her voice shaking. The boys were snickering, making mocking gestures, typical teenage crap. I held up my hand to cut them off. What do you mean, grabbed you? I asked. Kayla pointed a shaky finger down the slope. That's when we saw the tracks. They were huge, way too big to be bare. The paw print was shaped like a dog's, but the claws, they were something else, long and curved like talons. They led from the undergrowth up to where Kayla had been standing, then turned abruptly and disappeared back into the bushes. Wolf, one of the boys said, but his usual bravado was gone. Never seen wolf tracks like that, I muttered, worry gnawing at my gut. We huddled there for a minute, rain starting to pelt down, the wind whipping through the trees. We gotta turn back, Melissa said. Her voice held a note of fear I rarely heard in her. For once, I agreed. We backtracked for an hour, the storm growing fiercer. Usually, with teenagers, the bad weather would just ramp up their bad attitudes. But now they were quiet, casting wary glances into the woods. We finally found a sheltered spot, a rocky overhang at least big enough to keep most of the rain off. I started getting a fire going. The kids huddled together like a pack of lost puppies. That's when the rustling started. At first, it was just the wind through the trees. But then came a heavier sound, the snap of branches, the unmistakable thud of footfalls just outside our circle of firelight. The whispering started among the kids, their eyes wide. We didn't say the word. But the same thought was in all our minds, whatever made those tracks had followed us. The woods fell silent. Too silent. The air felt heavy, charged with a waiting, predatory kind of tension. And then Melissa pointed towards the far side of the overhang. Two eyes gleamed in the darkness. Yellow, filled with a cold hunger that sent shivers through me. The eyes blinked, moved closer. I fumbled for the rifle I kept slung across my back, but knew it wouldn't matter much if the creature decided to charge out of the blackness. The minutes stretched out, an eternity of watching those eyes flicker in and out of sight. And then, as suddenly as it had arrived, the presence was gone. There was no sound of retreat, just an abrupt, chilling silence. We huddled around the dying embers of the fire, nobody sleeping a wink. When dawn finally broke, we packed up what was left of our gear and practically ran down the mountain. We made it back to the ranger station just as the storm fully broke. Filed an incident report, the higher-ups sent out a search team. They never found anything, no tracks, no scat. No sign of any animal that matched what we saw. The kids were sent home, the program shut down. I still visit the Smokies sometimes, but only on day hikes, well-traveled trails. When I'm on those trails, I sometimes catch a whiff of something musky and wild, or see a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye. And sometimes, in the dead of night, I wake up in a cold sweat and see two yellow eyes staring at me from the darkness. A few months later, I heard about a hiker vanishing on a remote trail in the Smokies. Then another. And another. The disappearances made the news, but the stories never quite matched up. Sometimes a witness claimed seeing a huge wolf-like creature, sometimes there were just eerie oversized tracks found near the site. Whatever it was, 
the park officials were stumped, and the public was getting scared. The part that chilled me to the bone was how it echoed what I'd felt that night, the unnatural silence before the encounter, the oppressive sense of being stalked by something just beyond the light. Part of me knew I should speak up, tell them what happened with the kids' program. But another part, the scared part, whispered that. Nobody would believe me. They'd chalk it up to stress, to an overactive imagination fueled by too many nights in the deep woods. I got a job managing gear at an outdoor store in Asheville. Tried to put the whole thing behind me, tried to convince myself it was just a freak occurrence, an unknown predator in the vast wilderness. I even forced myself to hike a few popular trails, just to exorcise my demons. It helped, a little. The nightmares faded, the cold prickle of fear receded to the back of my mind. Then came the day Lisa walked into the store. She was new to the area, her eyes bright with the enthusiasm of someone planning their first big backpacking trip in the Smokies. I found myself giving her all the usual safety advice, the standard tips seasoned hikers know by heart. And that's when it hit me, this bright-eyed woman, eager to explore the mountains I now feared, she might never come back. I hesitated, then took a deep breath. Listen, I started, my voice hoarse, there's something you need to know. I told her everything. I told her about the tracks, the creature in the storm, the disappearances. Her smile faltered, but she listened intently, a flicker of doubt in her eyes that echoed my own long-ago skepticism. When I finished, the question hung in the silence between us. Do you believe me? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. She looked at me for a long moment, then nodded. I do. Thank you for telling me. She left the store without buying a single thing. I don't know if she ever did go through with that hike, don't know if my warning saved her life. But as I watched her walk out the door, a weight lifted from my shoulders, a weight I didn't realize I'd been carrying. I'd stayed silent for too long, trapped by fear and self-preservation. Speaking up, owning my experience, it was a start. Word of my story spread. Not through the news, or official reports, but through the whispering network of hikers, those in tune with the undercurrents of the mountains. Some scoffed, of course. Most remained skeptical, but there was a shift, a recognition of the unknown lurking in the shadows. The disappearances continued, growing bolder. A few years ago, a half-eaten body was found, the wounds consistent with an attack by a massive predator, but bearing those same elongated claw marks. The news sent a jolt of horror through the outdoor community. An official investigation started up again, but to no avail. Every whisper, every shred of alleged evidence led to a dead end. The Park Service posted new warning signs, urging caution in remote areas. They never explicitly said what might be out there, but the implication hung unspoken in the air. I haven't been back to the Smokies since the day I walked away from the job. Part of me longs to return, to face my fear head on. Another part knows that some wounds never fully heal. I keep tabs from afar, reading news reports, scanning hiker forums for the latest sightings and rumors. It's become a morbid obsession, this tracking of a darkness I was lucky enough to escape. People tell me I should move on, forget about what happened. They say it'll eat me up if I don't. Maybe they're right but I still see those yellow eyes in my nightmares. They flicker in the shadows at the edge of my vision. And some nights, 
When the wind whistles through the trees outside my apartment window, I swear I hear a deep, rumbling howl, echoing from some distant, forgotten corner of my memory. It's a reminder that the wild places hold secrets beyond our understanding, and sometimes, the price of survival is to carry the weight of what you've witnessed. This happened to me a few years back, just another camping trip with my wife gone wrong. I'm Keith, been city born and raised, but she's a country girl through and through. Talks me into these outdoorsy adventures I'm usually none too keen on, this time up in the Pacific Northwest. You know, dense forests, towering mountains, that kind of thing. First few days weren't so bad. The trail was clear, weather holding out, and even I had to admit, being out in all that wilderness was kinda peaceful. Sure, got the usual animal noises at night, rustling in the bushes, figured it was deer or something. Then the third night, things got, weird. We're sitting around the fire, roasting marshmallows, when this howl echoes off the hillsides. Didn't sound like a wolf or a coyote, or anything I'd ever heard before. Deep, long, a mournful kind of sound that made the hairs on my arms stand up. My wife laughs, says I'm getting spooked. Bigfoot, honey, she says with a grin, maybe you'll finally see one of those creatures you think are a hoax. I joke back, but deep down, a sliver of unease settles in my gut. That howling comes again, each time seeming closer. Maybe not so funny now. Next morning, I'm up before dawn, breaking camp. We gotta get back to civilization. My wife's rolling her eyes, but I'm dead serious. On the hike down, that sense of being watched starts to get real strong. I keep glancing back half expecting to see some hulking figure in the trees, but nothing. We just push on, faster now, a rising sense of urgency propelling us. Around midday, I see it. A print in the soft mud near the trail. Massive, bigger than any bear, in the claws, damn things looked like they could rip through a tree trunk. My wife finally gets that this ain't some joke anymore. We pick up the pace, practically jogging the last few miles. Finally burst out into the trailhead parking lot, and find it empty. Not a damn car in sight, including ours. Someone must have moved it. Great. Just freaking great. I call for a tow truck but there's no cell reception out here, not a surprise. We're gonna have to hoof it to the nearest town. My wife, bless her heart, tries to make light of it. Come on, it'll be an adventure, she says, that familiar sparkle still in her eyes. Adventure my ass. We start down the road. It's miles to the next sign of civilization, Sun starting to get low, casting those long shadows that make everything look spooky. The silence is heavy, no birds, not even the wind in the trees. Just this dead quiet that sets my nerves on edge. Then, from behind us, a low growl. We both freeze. Slowly, I turn and see it standing on the rise just past where the trailhead meets the road. Huge, towering over even the tallest pines, covered in dark bristly fur. Muzzle long and filled with way too many teeth. Yellow eyes locked on us. Dogman. All those stories I dismissed as nonsense come flooding back. My wife takes a step back, a look on her face I've never seen before. We need to run, I say my voice coming out shaky. No, she replies, stepping in front of me, reaching for something in her pack. 
I got this. She pulls out, fireworks? One of those big Roman candle things you set off on the 4th of July? Is this woman serious? Before I can protest, she's lighting it. The flare crackles to life and she hurls it at the creature. It recoils, hissing, momentarily distracted. Run, my wife screams, and we take off. We don't get far. It's after us in a flash, so damn fast. Leaps past us and lands in front, blocking the road. My heart pounds in my throat. It's closing in now, those eyes gleaming. Then, another noise cuts through the air. A gunshot. The beast yelps, startled. Another shot rings out, and it turns tail and bolts back into the woods. A truck screeches to a halt, some local guy leaning out the window, rifle raised. Get in, he shouts, and we scramble into the bed of the truck, breathless and shaking. He speeds us to the nearest town, gets us a room at the motel, buys us beers even. Tells us not to go wandering off alone in these parts. That those things are more common than most folks realize. We stay up most of the night, wired and unable to sleep. In the morning, we hitch a ride back to the trailhead, find our car untouched. We don't talk about going back into those woods again. Sometimes, some adventures you just don't survive. The drive home was silent, punctuated only by the muted hum of the engine and my racing thoughts. My wife squeezed my hand once tried to smile, but it looked strained through the exhaustion. We kept checking the rearview mirror, half expecting to see that hulking figure loping after us. Back in the safety of our apartment, everyday life seemed to resume. Work, grocery shopping, walks in the park, but a shadow hung over it all. I jumped at every creak of the floorboards, every rustle outside the window. My wife, Eva the Rock, tried to reassure me it was over. But those eyes, they haunted me. A few weeks later, it started. Small things at first. My wife mentioning that flicker of movement she thought she saw out of the corner of her eye. A thud against the window late at night, like something big hitting the glass. Then, on her evening run, she swore something was stalking her through the park, disappearing just before she turned a corner. I tried to brush it off, stress, paranoia. But I was out there with her the next day. I felt it too, that prickling sensation of being watched, the heavy silence that seemed to settle over the park like a suffocating blanket. One night, the phone rang. My wife answered, the color draining from her face. It was the park ranger from the town near the trailhead. He said there'd been a sighting. Something fitting the description. Then the chilling detail, they found a hiker's campsite, torn apart. No body, but blood. Lots of blood. That was it. The breaking point. We sold our camping gear, booked a one-way flight across the country as far from those woods as we could get. New city, new apartment, one of those sterile high-rises overlooking a bustling street. Surely, nothing could find us here. We built a life, as best we could. Busy jobs, trying to make new friends, exploring the city. I found myself drawn to those online forums, those shadowy corners where people shared their own chilling encounters. We weren't alone. There were others out there, those who had seen glimpses, survived terrifying ordeals, those who had lost loved ones to the creatures lurking in the wild places. I even started carrying a concealed weapon. My wife hated it 
but she understood. It wasn't just for physical protection, it was that sliver of control in a world that suddenly felt completely out of my grasp. One rainy fall evening, we were on our way home from dinner. The city noises, the traffic, it was supposed to be comforting, a wall between us and the wilderness. But as we entered our building lobby, a wave of that familiar, chilling unease washed over me. Before I could say anything, my wife gasped and pointed. There, scrawled across the concrete wall and what looked horrifyingly like blood was a crude drawing. A massive wolfish form, claws outstretched, and those familiar, glowing eyes. Just below it, a single word, soon. My blood ran cold. They'd found us. Even here, surrounded by concrete and steel, we weren't safe. We fled our apartment that night, barely packing essentials. Found a cheap motel on the outskirts of town, tried to form a plan. We couldn't hide forever. We had to learn more, figure out a way to fight back, if not for ourselves, then to protect others from this monstrous threat. The next morning, news broke. A grisly attack at a nearby park, the victims torn apart. The story was horrific, but amidst the fear, a flicker of grim determination ignited in me. These creatures, they were a very real danger. People still thought they were myths, legends. But we knew better. We knew the truth. That night, as headlights swept across the motel room windows, my wife looked at me. In her eyes, I saw a reflection of my own resolve. We can't run anymore, I said, hefting my backpack. It's time to hunt. We wouldn't be some cowering victims caught in the shadows. We, the survivors, the ones who bore the scars, we were going to turn the tables. We would track those monstrous hunters across state lines and mountain ranges. We'd expose them, force a reckoning. And if it cost us our lives, well, at least we would go down fighting for a world that no longer believed in monsters, desperately in need of reminding. This happened to me a few years back. I was living out that off-the-grid dream, you know? Tiny cabin up in Maine, wood stove for heat, chopping my own firewood, the whole deal. Grew some vegetables, tapped my maple trees, figured I'd finally get to writing that novel I always talked about. Turns out, the simple life brings its own kind of problems. Started with little things, stuff you brush off at first. I'd leave trails of firewood stacked neat next to the cabin, wake up to them knocked over. Figured maybe a bear or some deer, no biggie. Then one night, I hear this crazy howling outside. Not like a coyote or wolf, something deeper, more. I don't know, almost human, but off. Sent chills down my spine. My name is David by the way. Nice to meet you, sort of. Wish the circumstances were better. Anyway, the howling gets worse, more frequent. I find some weird tracks in the mud, big but not bare big. Two legs, way too big to be human, claw marks too deep. Start keeping the rifle my dad taught me to use close by. Tells me I was getting paranoid, but folks who live alone in the woods get to be. Then I see it. Tall, maybe seven feet, hunched over with this mangy, matted fur. Two eyes glowing yellow that cut through the dark like headlights. The way it moves, too fast, too jerky, not an animal I ever saw. Gives me a good long look then vanishes back into the trees. That was when I started getting the calls. 
not phone calls. That would have made too much sense. No signal out there. More like these, voices whispering in my head. Not words exactly, just sounds. Scratches, clicks, wet breathing noises, and underneath it all, this low growl that made my stomach twist. Days go by, and the whispering grows louder, the feeling that I'm being watched never leaves. My dog, Scout, she'd bark at the tree lean, hackles up. But she was old, figured maybe she was just getting senile, picking up squirrels or something. Till one morning, I wake to silence. Scout's gone. Search the woods near the cabin, calling her name. Nothing. Not even a trace, no blood. Like she up and vanished, and I knew right then, whatever was out there had taken her. The worst part was that I couldn't leave. Winter was setting in, the road was impassable at that point. I was stuck there with that thing stalking me. So I fortified the place. Boarded up the ground floor windows, set simple traps, nothing fancy, just stuff to give me some warning. Kept the rifle loaded with those thick slugs you use for bear. I wasn't about to become its next snack. Nights were the worst. The scratching at the walls, the guttural grunts right outside while the whispers echoed in my head. Barely slept at all. Started talking to myself, just to hear some kind of normal sound. One night, I thought I saw a flickering shadow pass a window. I jump up, my heart pounding, rifle raised. Then, there it is again, bigger this time, hulking in the moonlight. Yellow eyes staring right at me. That was when I snapped. I fired, right through the boarded up window. Glass shattered, and I heard a roar unlike anything I dreamt of in my worst nightmares. It crashed away into the darkness. For a second, there's silence, and I almost think I got it. Then the thing came for the door. It smashed against the old wood, again and again, the whole cabin shaking. I could hear the splintering, see the door frame buckle. It kept bashing its body against it with sickening thuds, those guttural growls ripping through the night. I retreated upstairs, fumbling for more shells. One shot, maybe two more left. Not nearly enough. It was only a matter of time before the door gave out. I started to calculate, to figure out how I could jump out the back window, make a run for it into the trees. But something stopped me. It was that whispering again, louder than it had ever been. Not random sounds anymore, but words forming in my head, raspy and rough, in a language I couldn't understand, but the meaning was crystal clear. This place, mine. I stumbled back, the floor tilting under my feet. There was another crash downstairs, a splintering of wood louder than any gunshot. It wasn't coming for me, not tonight. It was claiming this place. This tiny cabin out in the middle of nowhere. I stayed frozen in that upstairs room, listening to the thing tear into the cabin below. Every smash, every guttural growl told me I was spared, just this once. Exhaustion washed over me, a deep, bone weariness that came from nights of terror. I sank against the wall and closed my eyes. Must have dozed off because when I woke, the house was silent. Morning light filtered through the dusty window, a sickly yellow against the snowdrifts outside. I crept downstairs, rifle raised. The door hung off its hinges, wood splintered where the beast had rammed its way through. Inside, my cabin was wrecked. Furniture overturned, supplies scattered, 
walls marked with deep claw marks. No bodies. No blood stains, just wreckage. The creature was gone. Outside, its tracks crisscrossed the fresh snow, big four-toed prints leading away into the trees. I followed them, at a distance, driven by some mix of horror and desperate curiosity. I needed to know what I was dealing with, or what was left of my sanity would surely crumble. The tracks wound deeper into the woods, to a place where the trees huddled closer, casting the ground in perpetual gloom. Here I found it, not a cave, but a tangle of roots and fallen logs. Underneath, a gap in the earth, big enough for something big. The smell hit me first rotting meat and something damp and musty. This was its den. I circled, trying to find a better angle, and that's when I saw them. Not scout, thank God, but pieces of things. Animal remains I think, ripped to shreds. Then something else, smaller, a tattered bit of red flannel. It belonged to old Mike, a hermit who lived deeper into the woods, the one person I'd occasionally run into on supply runs. A twig snapped behind me. I turned, rifle raised, but too slow. The creature slammed into me, knocking me flat. I felt claws rake across my back, burning through the layers of my coat. Its weight bore me down, a foul, hot breath washing over my face. I scrambled wildly for the rifle, saw its gleaming eyes, smelled the meat rot in its maw. Then, a blinding flash. A gunshot rang out from somewhere above. The creature shrieked, rearing back. A second shot, and it staggered. I scrambled free, catching a glimpse of a figure on the ridge above, dark against the treeline, rifle smoke curling into the air. The creature snarled, but it didn't come back for me. Instead, it bounded away, limping, towards its den. The figure on the ridge yelled down, a woman's voice rough and urgent, asking if I was okay. I was bleeding, battered, and probably in shock, but alive. Turns out, her name was Sarah. She was a hunter, had been tracking those weird prints for weeks, found bits and pieces of missing livestock, missing hikers, even caught sight of the creature, just once. We stayed hidden and tracked the creature back to its den. And that's when the horror of it hit me. It wasn't alone. In the shadows of that underground den, I saw more glowing eyes, smaller, but no less chilling. This was generational, a nest. I felt a terrible sinking dread, remembering the words I'd heard whispered in my mind, this place, mine. We set a trap. Lured it out with the carcass of a deer. Sarah was a better shot put three quick rounds into it, right through the chest. We watched it fall, twitching, struggling. But when we crept closer, the eyes, those devilish yellow eyes, were on the pups. They were watching us from the shadows of the den. Aftermath? Hell, I don't know if there is one. We burned the den to the ground, but who knows if others survived. Sarah and I, we tried for a while, hunted the woods, found more tracks, followed them until they vanished. But you can't kill what you don't understand. It's out there, them, something that shouldn't be, lurking in the places we forgot about. That cabin's still mine, legally anyway. Never been back though. Sarah, she disappeared a few months later out on a solo hunt. They never found her body. I moved back to the city, took a crappy desk job. Noise, crowds, they're comforting now. 
I still hear the whispering sometimes, like an echo in my head and the scratches on the walls of a quiet apartment. I still see those yellow eyes in my dreams. And I know, they know, I haven't forgotten. This happened to me a few years back, back when I still thought adventure was worth the risk. I was living in Northern California then, up in the logging country of Trinity County. Not exactly off the grid, more like skirting the edge of it. A bit of land with an old airstream for a house, worked seasonal for the forest service, trail maintenance, fire lookout, that sort of thing. It paid the bills and kept me mostly out of people's way, which suited me just fine. Folks thought I was a little crazy for living out there alone. Honestly, half the time, I agreed. You get lonely. And during those long, wet winters, when the roads turn to mush, and even the nearest town feels a world away, your mind can play tricks on you. Or maybe it's not tricks at all. It started small, like a lot of bad things do. A messed up campsite, mine, that wasn't how I left it. Thought maybe some kids had been dorking around. Then I saw the tracks, too big for a person, too narrow for a bear. For toes and long, sharp claws. Didn't match any critter I'd ever seen. Started carrying my grandpa's old Winchester with me, the one he'd brought back from the war. That made me feel a little less dumb, anyway. My name's Jake, by the way. Jake Riley. And if you're thinking I sound like some wannabe mountain man, well, you wouldn't be wrong. But sometimes, the thing that makes you a bit of an outsider is the same damn thing that saves your life. It was late one night when I saw it for the first time. I was chopping wood the rhythmic thunk of the axe a comfort against the darkness. There was a break in the trees, a spot where the moonlight fell on a meadow below my campsite. And that's where it was. Upright on two legs, easily seven feet tall and covered in a rough-looking, brindled brown fur. Its head, that's the part that really got me. Like a wolf, only longer, sharper. Big, intelligent eyes that gleamed a wicked sort of yellow in the moonlight. Wasn't acting aggressive, not at first. Just watching. I froze, then slowly reached for the Winchester, rested against the fallen log. But when I turned back, it was gone. There were fresh tracks in the mud, big ones. And a lingering smell, musky and feral. That made my stomach churn. The next morning, I went back to that spot and tried to make sense of what I saw. The tracks continued into the woods, too deep for anything human. I decided then, screw it, it was time to go to town, stock up on supplies and ammo, and have a few stiff drinks at the old roadhouse. Maybe somebody there saw something similar could tell me if I was just imagining things. Roadhouse had its usual crowd, bikers, hunters, roughnecks from the lumber mill. I started chatting up the bartender, a big woman named Sandy, tough as nails, with a laugh like a chainsaw. Told her about the tracks, figuring she'd just roll her eyes and pour me another. Instead, she got quiet. Looked me up and down, said, You sure about the toes, Jake? Just four on those tracks? I nodded. Her face went a bit pale. Turns out, there were legends around these parts, old stories whispered in the backwoods. Stories about a creature, not quite a bear, not quite a man, a dogman. Sandy had heard M from her old man who'd heard them from his dad, and so on. I scoffed, 
tried to play it off like it was just a good story. But the seed was planted. Later that night, as I drove the bumpy dirt road back to my land, I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. The next few weeks were hell. Every crack of a branch, every rustle in the bushes sent me scrambling for the Winchester. I started setting traps, primitive things with snares and trip wires. I knew they were useless against something that big and smart, but it gave me something to do besides sit there and listen to the creeping silence. Then, Maggie went missing. Maggie was an old yellow lab, belonged to Tom Walker, a grizzled fire lookout stationed further up the mountain. I'd see him sometimes, coming to town for supplies, and Maggie would be trotting along beside him. Never a leash, never a bark, just a quiet, loyal presence. The day she went missing, I heard the commotion up on the ridge. Tom shouting her name, the echo of his voice carried down the wind. He came by my place later, desperate, asking if I'd seen her. There were tear tracks on his weathered face, something that caught me deeper than any monster story. We searched together, till the sun went down, calling Maggie's name into the darkening woods. Didn't find anything, not a trace. That night, neither of us slept. I think we both knew. Something out there had taken her. After Maggie vanished, it was like a switch flipped. The thing, the dogman, became bolder. The subtle signs were replaced with a terrifying certainty that I wasn't alone out there. It started leaving things near my camp. Bits of fur, bone fragments gnawed ragged. Once, it was a ragged piece of yellow fabric, the remains of Maggie's collar. I'd wake up to inhuman howls that raised the hair on my arms, echoing through the night. The scratchings at my airstream's thin wall went from tentative to aggressive, powerful claws gouging the metal. I stopped sleeping for more than a few fitful hours at a time, the Winchester always loaded and propped beside my narrow bed. Fear turned into a kind of desperate anger. I wasn't going to be some cowering victim. If this thing wanted my land, my life, it was in for a fight. I rigged up floodlights around the airstream, motion activated, hoping to catch it off guard one night. Dug a pit, covered it with branches, the kind of trap a kid might make, but better reinforced. It was stupid, reckless, but I was starting to unravel. Then, one rainy evening, it happened. The floodlights blazed on, so bright they nearly blinded me for a moment as I stumbled out, rifle raised. And there it was, caught in the harsh glare. Taller than any man, with rough, matted fur that dripped rainwater. The musculature beneath that fur was rippling, powerful, and unnatural. But the worst was the head, that wolf-like muzzle twisted into a snarl teeth like yellow daggers, and those eyes burning into mine. It lunged. I fired, more out of panic than aim. The shot echoed in the rain-soaked forest, but the creature seemed unfazed. It tore through my flimsy branches and disappeared into the undergrowth, the floodlights flickering out after it. For a moment, there was just the drumming of rain and the pounding of my own heart. Then I heard the scream. It was coming from Tom's place, further up the ridge. A high-pitched, terrified scream that abruptly cut off. I didn't hesitate. I ran, rifle clutched tight, stumbling over roots and rocks, driven by a fear that was colder than ice. Tom's cabin wasn't much more than a shack, its lights dimly flickering as I burst through the trees. The door was ajar, creaking in the wind. Inside, 
Well, let's just say it was like something out of a nightmare. Blood spattered everywhere, and poor old Tom. I won't go into the details, but suffice it to say, he hadn't gone easy. I staggered back outside, retching onto the damp ground. Then, through the trees, I saw a pair of glowing eyes fixed on me. The dogman was just watching, a dark silhouette against the rain. I knew then it was over. There was no fighting this, no outsmarting it. I was a sitting duck out there. Dawn found me on the road, what was left of my life packed into my beat-up truck. Heading south, away from the towering trees and the shadowed valleys, back to the world of crowded cities and noisy streets. I never looked back. Aftermath? Well, they never found Tom's body, at least the rest of it. Chalked it up to a bear attack or a mountain lion gone rogue. Nobody believes in monsters, not real ones anyway. I tried to settle back into a normal life, got an apartment in San Diego, took a job in construction. But I never sleep through a whole night, not anymore. I see those yellow eyes in my dreams, hear those echoing howls even above the traffic. Smell that musky, feral sun on the occasional ocean breeze. Some nights, real late, when the city is mostly quiet, I find myself staring at maps of Northern California, my finger tracing a line across the rugged terrain of Trinity County. It's an itch I can't scratch, a piece of my soul still lost up there in that dark forest. Part of me wonders, what if I went back? Armed to the teeth, ready for it this time. Hunt the hunter. Crazy, suicidal probably. But maybe, just maybe, the only way to beat a monster is to become a little monstrous yourself. This happened to me a few years back, just another fall camping trip gone horribly wrong. I'm Neil, by the way, and I like to think of myself as an experienced outdoorsman. I've backpacked solo for weeks on end. Maybe that streak of confidence is what made me so blind to the signs. I chose the Bridger Teton National Forest in Wyoming. Beautiful place vast stretches of wilderness, the perfect spot to ditch civilization for a while. I hit the trail, the crunch of leaves beneath my boots a satisfying soundtrack to the day. Everything felt perfect. That first night is where it started to get weird. I'd settled into camp, eaten, and was reading inside the tent with my headlamp on. A snuffling noise came from outside, something moving through the brush. Figured it was a deer, an elk maybe. They're not uncommon in the area. I stepped out, expecting to see the startled eyes of an animal caught in the light. But there was nothing. Just the sound of heavy footfalls fading into the darkness, and that sense of being watched. I got back in my tent and tried to shake it off. Nerves, probably. Reminded myself I was miles from anyone else, totally alone, imagination running wild. I drifted off to sleep with some uneasy feeling prickling at the back of my mind. The next morning, that feeling intensified. Call it intuition or whatever but I had this gnawing sense I wasn't being careful enough. I went off trail briefly to relieve myself and that's when I saw them. Massive paw prints sunk into the soft earth. Not just big, the shape was wrong. More elongated, with wickedly long claws that had shredded the forest floor. My mind raced, bear? A mountain lion maybe? but neither seemed to fit the bill. They were just off. I spent the next few hours walking on high alert, 
glancing over my shoulder, a constant sense of dread settled deep in my gut. It was almost a relief when it started to rain. The downpour would wash away those disconcerting tracks. I'd chalk the whole thing up to paranoia. Except, there was a problem. This wasn't a light drizzle. Thunder boomed across the peaks. Lightning flashed too close for comfort. My tent was back miles down the trail. I was soaked to the bone and getting dangerously cold. I needed to make a decision. I found an alcove in a cliff face, not much protection, but something. Rain whipped in sideways, the thunder now so loud it rattled my bones. And then I heard it, a howl. Not animal, something almost human, but distorted and monstrous. It echoed through the canyon, cut through the sound of the storm. My heart was in my throat. I was in serious danger. I knew it. But what could I do? I had a pocket knife and my trekking poles. Hardly weapons against whatever made that unearthly sound. I was about as trapped as you could be. Then a flicker of movement in the underbrush just beyond the curtain of rain. A pair of eyes, reflecting the lightning flashes, not animal eyes. Two wide set, glowing a strange, greenish yellow. And towering above those eyes, I saw a muzzle, an impossibly long snout filled with sharp teeth. I couldn't make out the rest, the downpour hit its form, but it was huge. Now I knew what those tracks had belonged to. Dogman. That's the name floating around in old legends and hushed whispers among park rangers. I dismissed it all as folklore, campfire stories. But seeing it, crouching there, it all came rushing back. The reports of hikers disappearing, the strange deaths blamed on animal attacks. I huddled against the rock wall, the rain like sheets of ice, trying to make myself as small as possible. Praying whatever that thing was, it would lose interest and disappear back into the storm. Minutes ticked by, each one an eternity, the glowing eyes never seeming to waver. Then it moved. Not forward, thankfully. It turned its mammoth head slightly looking away from my hiding spot. And, almost worse than the howling, a whimpering sound started. Like a dog, but deeper, laced with an unsettling hunger. Another set of eyes appeared, then another. I was surrounded. Whatever this pack was, they were closing in, the storm just a temporary deterrent. There was too much at stake to stay huddled in that alcove. My wife, my two kids, if I didn't get back to them. I gripped my trekking pole, took a deep breath, and ran. The rain cut into my skin, each drop a needle as I tore through the underbrush. My heart hammered a frantic rhythm. I didn't know where I was headed, only that I couldn't stay. Every rustle in the bushes sent fresh panic through me. I saw those eyes again, so many more now, ghostly yellow glimmers through the storm. They weren't giving chase, not yet. There was a twisted logic to it, a game. They were toying with me, flanking my escape, cutting off paths. My foot snagged on a root, and I sprawled forward, breath rasping in my chest. I was no match. Not here, not battered by the elements, not hunted by something from a nightmare. I was lost, the trail of fading memory. A sliver of hope flickered. My phone was in a waterproof pouch deep in my pack. I tore it out, fingers numb as I fumbled for the power button. The screen glowed. No service. Still, there was a map app, one that worked offline, thank God. 
I navigated frantically, trying to get a fix on my location. Where was the highway? Where was anything that resembled civilization? The screen flickered. Not from the rain. A shadow fell over it, and a monstrous hand, covered in bristly fur and tipped with dagger claws, snatched the phone. The device shattered like an egg. Terror exploded into desperate rage. I didn't think, just reacted. I swung my trekking pole, catching what must have been the creature's forearm. It let out a yelp, more of surprise than pain, and backed off a step. That gave me a moment, just long enough. I bolted, branches whipping at me, my aching body protesting with every step. Sounds followed, heavy thumps of footsteps, branches snapping. They were gaining, closing the distance. Then, the rain eased, just a little. And, through the trees, I saw it, the highway. I sprinted for that ribbon of asphalt, a burst of adrenaline propelling me. Car headlights pierced the night as they rounded a bend. I stumbled to the edge of the road, waving frantically. The car screeched to a halt, and a middle-aged woman jumped out, concern etched on her face. What happened to you? Are you hurt? Do you need? She broke off, eyes widening in horror as she focused on the trees behind me. Then they came out of the shadows. Three of them, huge, wolf-like silhouettes outlined against the trees, their eyes like burning embers. I screamed. I ran for the car, flung the door open. The woman was already behind the wheel. I piled in, slammed the door shut. She hit the gas, tires squealing, and we hurtled down the road, the creatures melting back into the night. We didn't stop driving until we reached a town big enough to have a police station. My story didn't make sense, lost, storm, something in the woods. I didn't say dogmen. I knew how that would sound. They patted me on the shoulder, handed me blankets, coffee. I didn't say anything more. Back home, the nightmares are unending. The image of those eyes, that gaping muzzle, haunts me. My wife thinks it's PTSD from getting lost. Maybe she's right. Maybe I blacked out and imagined it all. But the news reports don't lie. Each week another hiker in the area disappears. Rangers shrug, blame mountain lions, the weather. I check the details, the locations, each early close to my route through the forest. My trekking poles lie untouched, my tent still packed away. I haven't been back outside the city limits since. But I've also been doing research, old legends, suppressed reports, sightings that match my experience too closely for comfort. There's a pattern, a trail of missing people throughout the Rockies, the Appalachians, all blamed on the wild. I'm not crazy. I didn't imagine what I saw. They're out there, these creatures of the wild. Hunters, lurking on the fringes. Maybe I was lucky, maybe I just haven't hit their radar again, but something monstrous is sharing the woods with us, and most people never even know the danger they're in. This happened to me a few years back when I was trying out that whole homesteading thing. Figured, after all the lousy breaks I'd gotten, a cruddy childhood, that bum knee that ended my ball-playing dreams, a string of girlfriends who seemed drawn to trouble, getting away from it all was the answer. Found this cheap plot in West Virginia. An old farm gone to seed, tucked way back in the hollers. Figured if anything deserved the quiet life, it was me. 
turns out, sometimes quiet ain't all it's cracked up to be. My name's Luke, by the way, Luke Samson. And let me tell you, if you start hearing those backwoods banjo jokes running through your head, well, you ain't too far off. I wasn't exactly green going in. Grew up hunting and fishing, knew my way around a toolbox, and figured I could handle myself. But there's some things books and YouTube videos just don't prepare you for. Started with little things, stuff you try to shrug off. That first winter, I'd lose chickens. Not to predators, at least, none I recognized. Carcasses wouldn't be half-eaten, just drained. Then there was the howling. Not coyotes, deeper, and with a kind of mournful edge that sent shivers down my spine. Found tracks too, out in the muddy field behind the barn. Too big to be a dog, too many toes, with claws like a damn bear. Then I saw it. Not fully, just a shadowy shape moving through the old orchard at dusk. Upright, easily seven feet tall, covered in shaggy, dark fur. Didn't get a good look at the face, just the eyes. They glowed yellow in the half-light, like something from a bad horror movie. For a while, I tried to convince myself it was my imagination. Maybe a deformed bear, some odd genetic thing. Hiked myself up with a swig from the bottle of whiskey I kept for emergencies. Problem is, I kept seeing the damn thing. Out in the field, watching from the tree lean, always just beyond a good, clear look. Started leaving gifts for it, a dead rabbit, part of a deer carcass I got from a hunting buddy. Stuff would disappear, but it never felt like enough. Folks in town, they'd give me a funny look when I hinted around, asking about big animals or strange sightings. The old-timers would just nod and mutter something about the woods having eyes of their own. Wasn't much comfort there. Then came the night Sarah went missing. Sarah Hollins was from the next farm over, a few miles up the dirt track that passed for a road. Tough old lady, lived alone since her husband died. One morning, her goat shows up on my doorstep, bleeding its head off, and no sign of Sarah. Folks organized a search party. I knew deep down it was no use, that whatever took her, we weren't getting her back. We found her cabin, or what was left of it. Place was torn apart like a tornado hit it. Smeared blood everywhere, but no body. Folks muttered about cougars gone off track, but I knew better. I'd seen the tracks around her place before, same as around my own. That's when the town sheriff, old Ray Baker, actually sat down for a real talk with me. He'd been giving me the side eye since I moved in, probably thought I was just another city boy gone off his rocker. But in his eyes, I saw a flicker of something like fear. Son, he said, in his slow drawl, there's stories in these hills, go way back. Stuff your grandpappy might have told you around a campfire. About things, not quite natural. He talked about the dogman. Not a legend exactly, more like a whisper passed down. A creature of the deep woods, some said it was a spirit, others that it was flesh and blood, but meaner than any predator god put on this earth. He told me how to protect myself, salt lines around my property, iron amulets, stuff that sounded crazy to my rational brain. But then again, so did the idea of a seven-foot-tall, wolf-headed monster. I did what old Ray suggested and for a while, it seemed to help. The feeling of being watched eased, the howling went quiet. I started to think maybe, just maybe, this might work. 
maybe I could beat the thing at its own game. But that's the thing about monsters, they don't play fair. I woke up one night to a noise like a tree falling against my house. Before I could grab my shotgun, the front door tore off its hinges. There it was, in my living room, silhouetted against the moonlight. The moonlight bathed it in an eerie glow. Its fur matted and coarse where the moon hid it seemed to drink in the night. Those yellow eyes burned with primal hunger, focused right on me. I fumbled for the shotgun, legs tangled in my hastily discarded blanket. The creature snarled, a rumble and growl that made the old floorboards tremble. Time itself seemed to stretch out my panicked mind searching for some salvation in the backwaters of memory. Salt. That's what old Ray said. Flinging the useless covers aside, I scrambled for the kitchen. Salt shaker, it was my only weapon. Behind me, a crash split the air, and I knew it was through the bedroom wall. God only knew how long I had. The shaker was on the counter, an absurdly ordinary thing in the face of the horror stalking me. I grabbed it, fingers shaking, and spun around just as the creature broke into the kitchen. Moonlight glinted off its wicked claws, extended now, dripping with a fluid that wasn't quite blood. A desperate lunge, and I flung the entire contents of the salt shaker straight into its face. The dogman roared, a sound of pain and fury both. It clawed at its eyes, momentarily blinded. That was my chance. Forgetting the gun, I bolted for the back door, scrambling through the shattered wood and into the night. The old oak tree loomed ahead, sturdy and thick-limbed. I could hear the beast thrashing behind me, its howls now filled with rage. I climbed, my old football injury a dull ache that fear overshadowed. Branches scraped me, but I kept going, finding footholds and hauling myself desperately upwards. The dogman reached the base of the oak, its bulk slamming into the trunk. My heart hammered against my ribs, my breaths coming in ragged gasps. It circled the tree, then reared up testing the lowest branches with those terrifying claws. If it could reach me, then I was as good as dead. My hands found a higher branch, just out of reach, but maybe if I jumped. With a surge of near hysterical will, I flung myself upwards, fingers desperately grasping at the rough bark. Somehow, they held. I scrambled higher, sobs tearing at my throat until I was high enough that the creature's flailing paws were well below me. The salt must be wearing off. It howled in frustration, circled the tree, then stopped with chilling abruptness. As dawn began to tint the sky, the dogman turned, its gaze fixed on my battered house. I hardly dared breathe, my body trembling like a leaf in the wind. With slow, deliberate steps, it retreated into the shadows of the house. The first light painted a picture of devastation as I cautiously climbed down, every muscle screaming in protest. Ray arrived as the sun properly cleared the horizon, a posse of townsfolk at his back. I stood amidst the wreckage, a broken man, and told them everything. Ray didn't look surprised, just grim. That was the end of my homesteading dream. The dogman came back, once or twice, but the salt and iron kept it at bay long enough for me to pack up my things and leave. They found what was left of Sarah Hollins out in the deep woods a few weeks later. Some nights, I can still hear that mournful howl. I never went back to West Virginia. City life's not for me. Not entirely. Bought a little patch of land up north instead, quiet but not too isolated. 
I tell folks the bears up here are reason enough to stay armed. They nod sympathetically, but I ain't fooled, they think I'm just another broken guy seeing monsters in the shadows. Maybe they're right. Maybe I am. But up here, when the wind whistles through the pines on a lonesome night, I check the salt lines just in case. Because I know, even if no one else does, sometimes the monsters are real. This happened to me a few years ago. I'm not the kind of guy to make things up, not usually anyway. I live in Colorado, and I love the outdoors, especially the more remote spots. You wouldn't believe some of the places I've camped and hiked in, the kind of places you practically have all to yourself. One fall, I planned a trip into the Wemanish wilderness. Now that's truly isolated country. Figured it'd be perfect, right at the peak of the leaf-changing season. Packed up my truck, the usual gear, more than enough food and water, the whole routine. Took off and drove the whole day to get to the trailhead. Now, here's the thing. It was empty. Not a single car or any sign of people. That wasn't a surprise, sometimes these places are just like that, especially later in the season. Should have made me think twice, maybe, but I was excited about having the place to myself. First day on the trail went great. The colors were incredible. I hadn't seen anything like it. Got in a good seven or eight miles, set up camp, ate dinner while it was still light. That's when things got weird. I heard this howl. It wasn't a coyote. Not like anything I'd heard before. Deep, long, and it echoed strangely against the mountainsides. Figured it was probably just an elk, maybe one that was injured or something. It bothered me a little, but hey, it was nature. I turned in for the night. The next morning, I was up with the sun. Packed a day bag and hit the trail again thinking about getting a few high elevation picks before heading back to camp. Maybe three miles out, I rounded a bend, and there it was. Right in the middle of the trail. It was the biggest damn set of paw prints I'd ever seen. Claws like you wouldn't believe, dug right into the earth. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. I told myself, okay bear probably, a really big one. But in my gut, I knew that wasn't right. I snapped a few photos, measured the prints with my hand for reference, it didn't make sense. Bears don't walk like that. I don't know how to explain it better, other than the prints looked almost, wrong. I got out of there, practically ran back to the campsite packed up as quickly as I could. It was late in the day, but I wasn't sticking around. I kept glancing over my shoulder as I hiked back to the trailhead, hearing rustling in the bushes. Whatever had made those tracks probably wasn't far behind. Then, as the sun started setting, I heard the howl again. Same as the night before, deep and mournful, sending chills down my spine. Except this time, there was an answer. Another howl, closer, from a different direction. I nearly broke down and ran at that point. Instead, I did the only logical thing. I got in my truck and didn't look back. That night I stopped in the nearest town with a motel and tried telling myself it was my imagination going wild. But even now, when I look at those photos, the footprints, they're not right. The woods aren't the same for me anymore. I haven't been back out into the wilderness alone since. Sometimes I wonder if I ever really will. A few weeks back, I got a coffee with my buddy. Kellen. 
He works for the Forest Service, tough guy, been outdoors his whole life. We were shooting the breeze, and I decided, why not? Told him the story. Turns out, there's a ranger report from the same area, just a few weeks before my trip. Missing hiker, never found. Kellen gave me this hard look, didn't say a word, but he knew. That whole area, apparently, has a bit of a history of strange sightings, mostly brushed off as tall tales or misidentification. But now I'm thinking maybe those old stories are true. Maybe what I saw. The sun was setting. It had started to snow a little. Something howled in the distance, the sound chillingly familiar. A stray dog? Probably. But as I pulled out of the parking lot, I swear I saw a pair of eyes reflecting back at me from the tree line, eyes glowing in unnatural yellow, then darkness. I went home that night and locked every door, bolted every window. There was a part of me that was ready to dismiss it all again, to chalk it up to stress, to a trick of the light. But the image of those eyes burned in my mind, as clear as the oversized tracks imprinted on the trail. The following morning, my phone wouldn't stop buzzing. It was Kellen. His voice was tight, laced with an urgency I'd never heard before. Listen, get online. Search your name, no, the whole town name, and missing. I did as he said my heart pounding with a sickening sense of dread. There it was. Multiple local news reports. A middle-aged woman gone missing while hiking just outside of the town limits. The description, petite, dark hair, a colorful backpack, it matched the woman I'd passed on the trail that very first day. A wave of nausea washed over me. I'd seen her, maybe even exchanged a brief hello, and all along. Kellen called me back. His voice was low, barely a whisper. I did some unofficial digging. There's been an uptick, hikers disappearing, the official story is animal attacks, bad weather, the usual. But there's something else, stories. He told me the rumors monstrous sightings, whispers of an old legend the local tribes once spoke of. His sources were shaky, old-timers reluctant to talk, rangers on the verge of retirement. None of it verifiable, tangible, but it fit. It fit with the eyes in the darkness, with the impossible footprints. Dogman, he finally said, a single word heavy with unspoken implications. I don't know how to describe my feelings in that moment. Fear, naturally. But beneath that, a strange sense of inevitability. Like the pieces of a gruesome puzzle had finally clicked into place. Days turned into weeks. I followed the news obsessively, each new missing person fueling my dread. Kellen would send updates, what little he could gather cryptic messages, hints of investigations quietly snuffed out. The authorities were turning a blind eye, it seemed, content to let the disappearances fade into unsolved cases. I sold my camping gear, moved closer to the city, and found a job that didn't require going outdoors. I thought that maybe, if I hid, if I made myself small and unremarkable, the thing in the woods wouldn't notice me anymore. That was naive. One night, driving home from work, headlights slicing through the fog, I saw it. A towering figure, hunched on the side of the road, ripping into something. It looked up as I approached, those yellow eyes reflecting back at me. Then, it was gone disappearing into the fog with impossible speed. 
I stepped on the gas, adrenaline surging as I swerved to avoid whatever mangled carcass it had left behind. I knew with absolute certainty, it was only a matter of time. The disappearances in the area continue. Local news writes them off as unsolved mysteries. I'm next. I know it. I can hear those howls some nights, closer now. Closer and closer. I don't tell people my story anymore. They look at me like I'm crazy. Maybe I am. Maybe what I saw had a rational explanation, but deep down, I know the truth. The woods hold something monstrous, and it's hunting. Even as I write this, I can feel it, patiently waiting for me to slip up, to leave a window unlatched, a door ajar. Maybe writing this is just another way of drawing its attention. A foolish last act of defiance. Or perhaps, when they find whatever is left of me, this will serve as a warning. Sometimes the lines between fact and folklore blur. Sometimes the old stories are true. And sometimes, sometimes there are things lurking in the wilderness, things that were never meant to be seen, things that defy belief and make a mockery of everything we thought we knew. This happened to me a few years back, a time I don't like to revisit. I'm Bryson, worked in construction then, but don't anymore. My buddy, Jace, was the adventurous type, always dragging me along for some crazy fishing trip or hike. I wasn't the outdoors sort, but hell, it beats sitting around all weekend. Besides, Jace was family more so than my actual brother. This one time, he talked up this pristine lake, way out in the Gila wilderness of New Mexico. Claimed it had trout the size of your arm, and nobody around for miles. He'd heard stories from some old ranger he met in a bar. That should have set the alarm bells ringing, but, well, Chase could be persuasive. We trekked in for a full day the trail barely visible in places. Finally, we broke through the trees, and there it was. The lake was stunning, clear and green, reflecting the mountains all around. Jace grinned at me, that wide, goofy grin of his. For a moment, the long hike and my aching feet seemed worth it. We set up camp at the edge of the water. Jace got his rods out practically before his backpack hit the ground. I mostly sat, tossed some rocks into the water, soaking in the quiet. Jace was right, the place was a damn postcard. I even cracked a joke about it, trying to get into the spirit. Night hit hard and fast. It gets dark in those mountains, and cold. But hey... That's the price of getting away from it all, right? Jace had a fire going quick, and we were laughing, the same old crap, and the tension of the week started to melt away. Then the howling started. It cut through everything. Not a wolf, I knew that much. This was, more guttural, more human-like, but wrong. Jace froze beside me, face pale. Then came something worse, a crashing noise from the trees behind us. We bolted for the tents, the fire forgotten. Zipping myself into the tiny tent felt futile, but what else could we do? The noises kept coming, howls, snarls, circling us for what felt like hours. Finally, they faded. Dawn arrived, slow and gray. I finally unzipped the tent and crawled out. Jace's tent was empty. More than that, it was ripped. Just shredded, like some kind of beast had done it, and blood was smeared all over the opening in the ground. Reason left me then. 
I took off running, the pack with all our food and gear forgotten. I must have stumbled right into the creature because it was there all of a sudden, towering over me. It stood upright like a man, but hunched over, easily seven feet tall. The fur was matted, patchy, in its eyes, damn those eyes, they were pure yellow, glowing with a kind of cold intelligence. The snout was long, the teeth, enormous, like nothing I'd seen in the southwest. The claws, that was the worst. Big, jagged, like someone took a rake and twisted it all wrong. I remember thinking, clear as day, this isn't real. This can't be real. Then the creature took a step towards me, growled low in its throat. And somehow, my legs found the strength to move. I took off like hell was nipping at my heels because there was something worse than fear chasing me now. The certainty that thing was gonna catch me, rip me apart like it did Jace. I ran for what felt like forever, fell a dozen times, scraped myself to the bone against branches, rocks, didn't matter. The adrenaline and the terror pushed me until finally, the trees blurred and gave way to a dirt road. There was an old pickup truck rattling along. I waved like a lunatic, and by some miracle, it pulled over. That's when I started screaming, and then I think I blacked out. The truck screeched to a halt, kicking up dust. Driver was an old timer, squinting at me with a mix of alarm and suspicion. I was a mess, bloody, clothes torn, babbling like a madman about some thing in the woods. He was probably reaching for a gun instead of a phone. But then he saw my eyes. Whatever was on my face made him pause. He hauled me into the cab, muttering about the nearest ranger station. The truck lurched and rattled down the road, but I couldn't focus on that, couldn't stop seeing Jace's tent slashed open, his blood soaking the ground. The ranger station was small, just a cabin and a few outbuildings. But it felt like I'd reached salvation. Two rangers, a man and a woman, rushed out. Their faces, at first concerned, shifted into something else, a wary alertness, like they knew what kind of crazy I wasn't. They listened. Well, at least at first. I told them about Jace, about the thing in the trees, the glowing eyes. The rangers exchanged a look I didn't like. The woman, her name was Sarah, tried to sound soothing, said bears were common. The man, Tom, was gruffer, told me I was probably in shock. The old Timur finally spoke up. Told them he found me ranting about some monster near the old fire tower, that direction. He gestured out back, into the dense trees. The rangers looked uncomfortable. They glanced at each other again. Sarah touched the hilt of her sidearm. Then Tom did something surprising. He reached out, gripped my shoulder, looked me dead in the eye. Son, he started, there's things in these woods the guidebooks don't mention. Stuff I ain't never seen, but... He hesitated. But some locals, they talk about something. Big, hairy, walks upright. My breath hitched. You think? I ain't saying what I believe, not yet, he said. But we know folks go missing here every year. Some are never found. He motioned to Sarah, and they both turned, heading into the station, rifles appearing in their hands. You stay put, Tom ordered, but I wasn't about to listen. I scrambled out the passenger side, stumbled after them. We went into those woods, the old Timur gripping a shotgun behind us. The three of them moved with a purpose I hadn't seen in the city, scanning everything. 
It didn't take long. Chase's campsite was a ruin, just as I'd left it. The Ultimer made a low, horrified noise. Sarah crouched, pointing to tracks, enormous and misshapen. Something heavy had been dragged away, leaving a trail through the underbrush. The sun was getting low, and the woods were full of long shadows. I wanted to turn back, but the rangers and the old Timur moved forward, grim-faced. The trail ended at the base of the fire tower, a rusted metal skeleton jutting up from the trees. And right there, a pile of something. It took a moment. Then the bile rose in my throat. It was Jace, what was left of him. Torn to pieces, like a, a doll ripped up by some monstrous child. Tom swore. Sarah covered her mouth, her eyes wide with horror. The old Timur, though tough as nails, went white. And above the treetops, a howl broke through the twilight. A howl that was answered by another deeper in the woods. And suddenly, we knew we weren't alone. This happened to me a few years back, when I was a park ranger in Alaska. I know, dream job for a nature-loving guy like me, right? Got myself a little cabin in Denali National Park, cozy, isolated, just the way I liked it. Folks said I was nuts when they found out where I was posted, but after years in the military, quiet and alone ain't so scary. My name's Travis, by the way, Travis Kane. The first six months were bliss. Long hikes, stunning scenery, and enough solitude to make me forget city life ever existed. Even made friends with some of the regulars in the nearby town of Healy, gruff old miners, bush pilots, the type you only find up here. Sure, the winters could be brutal, and once I had to scare off a curious grizzly, but hey, that's part of the deal. Things started to change in early spring. Not suddenly, just a creeping sense of unease. Found myself hearing rustling sounds at odd hours, like something moving around my cabin at night. Dismissed it as wolverines or maybe a moose calf wandering too close. Then, on one of my patrols, I stumbled across an elk carcass, half-devoured, but not in a way any normal predator would leave it. The bones were picked eerily clean, and there were deep gashes in the hide, like from claws way bigger than a bear's. A knot formed in my gut, and suddenly those midnight noises weren't so easy to explain away. I told myself it was my imagination playing tricks in the long hours of twilight. Told myself it was the isolation starting to gnaw at me. Didn't tell no one, that's for sure. Folks around here, they're tough, but a grown man talking about monsters in the woods? Yeah, that wouldn't go over well. But it kept happening. More torn up carcasses, never fully eaten, always with those same strange marks. I started finding tracks too, massive prints in the mud near the rivers. Too many toes, too wide, like nothing I'd seen in any guidebook. The whispering doubts in the back of my mind grew louder. Locals must have noticed something was up, because old Jonas, a trapper who'd been in these parts longer than I'd been alive, pulled me aside one night at the tavern. Heard talk about those kills, he rasped, his voice barely above a whisper even in the noisy bar. Ain't no bear did that, nor no wolf pack. There's things in these woods, things best left alone. He stared at me, his eyes dark and serious beneath bushy eyebrows. That night, I took my rifle from my cabin wall a habit I'd shed months ago. Couldn't shake the feeling, the certainty, that I wasn't alone out there anymore. 
Next morning, I filed an incident report, standard procedure for abnormal wildlife activity. Figured some biologist might get a kick out of the mysterious tracks. Never expected what happened next. A whole damn team descended on Healy, park officials, wildlife experts, even a couple guys in suits who didn't give their names. They questioned me for hours, made me take them to the kill sites. I started to wonder if they thought I was faking the whole thing for attention. Then the suits pulled me aside, away from the others. Son, one of them said, his voice low and grim, you saw something you weren't supposed to see. There are things out there, things we don't talk about. They told me to keep quiet, do my job, and forget what I saw. Said they'd handle it. There was a threat in their eyes, a silencing kind of threat. I did as they said. What choice did I have? Small town park ranger against the government, yeah, not a fight I was gonna win. But I couldn't forget. That feeling of being watched, that prickle down my spine, it intensified. One moonless night, I was working late in the office, trying to bury myself in paperwork to avoid thinking about those woods. A noise yanked my attention from the files. A growl, deep and rumbling, coming from right outside the window. I froze, heart pounding in my ears. Slowly, I stood, every muscle in my body screaming at me to run. I crept to the window, expecting to see a bear, maybe even a whole pack of wolves. What I saw, my mind still recoils from it, even after all this time. Standing on its hind legs, easily seven feet tall, was a creature straight out of nightmares. Shaggy, dark fur covered its massive frame, and its head, it was like a wolf, but twisted, elongated, the teeth far too long for even the biggest predator. Its eyes glowed a sickly yellow in the reflected light, filled with pure, hungry malice. For a moment, we just stared at each other across the glass. Then, it let out another growl, long and guttural, that seemed to shake the cabin's very walls. The sound broke me out of my stupor. I stumbled back, knocking over my chair, eyes fixed on the window where the creature had been. But it was gone, vanished into the night as quickly as it appeared. I didn't even think, just reacted grabbed my gear, threw whatever I could fit into my truck, and burned rubber out of that town. Never looked back. Didn't stop driving for two days straight, only pulling over for gas and bathroom breaks. Ended up in some cheap motel in New Mexico, shaking and sweating, a broken record of what I'd seen playing in my head. Tried to tell myself it was a dream a psychotic break caused by stress and too much time alone. But even now, years later, I still see those yellow eyes in my nightmares. I still hear that bone-chilling growl echoing across the windswept mountains. The government probably cleaned up the mess in Healy, wiped away any trace of those killings, of whatever I saw out there. They're good at making things disappear but I can't pretend it didn't happen. Every time I read about some hiker gone missing in the Alaskan wilderness, every time there's a sighting of something big and blurry caught on some hunter's trail cam, I know. They say ignorance is bliss. Sometimes, I wish I didn't know what lurks in the shadows of the wild places. Part of me wants to go back, find the truth, whatever it is. A bigger part of me knows that's a path that leads straight to madness, or worse. This happened to me a few years back, back when I was trying to reconnect with nature and escape the rat race for a while. 
you probably read about those van life folks, or those cabin in the woods types. I wasn't exactly that committed, but the idea of solitude, a life unplugged, yeah, that had an appeal after my divorce. So, when I found that rambling old farmhouse out in Tennessee, tucked back where the hills start to get serious, it felt like fate. Sure, it was a wreck, the roof needed some love, the wiring was older than I was, fields overgrown. But the price was right, and hey, I wasn't afraid of a little elbow grease. My name's Derek, by the way, Derek Langston. First couple months, it was heaven. Fixing stuff felt good, like I was actually accomplishing something for once. Got myself a couple chickens, a goat for dairy, cleared out a space for a vegetable garden. Even the locals were friendly enough after I stopped by the general store a few times, proving I wasn't some city slicker there to cause trouble. Sheriff Ellis, a big bearded dude with a slow drawl, even gave me some tips on planting times and warned me about the wild hogs that were getting bold. Life was simple, and I was starting to see why folks got hooked on living this way. Kinda laughed at those podcasts I used to listen to, the ones always buzzing about prepping for the apocalypse or homestead defense or whatever. Seemed to me, worst thing here was a stubborn goat. Then came the noises. At first, it was nothing, stuff I could explain away. Old house settling, a critter getting into the barn, normal, right? But after a while, it started getting hard to ignore. That rustling in the cornfield out back wasn't the wind. That low growl, deep and rumbling like nothing I'd ever heard, sure as hell wasn't a coyote. And once, just once, I swear I saw a shadow move at the edge of the tree lean, big, upright, slinking into the darkness so fast I wondered if I'd imagined it. I started sleeping with the shotgun by my bed, old military training kicking in, that sense of unease you never quite shake. Figured worst case, it was a mountain lion that strayed off course. Told myself that the noises were my brain, primed for danger and playing tricks on me. Problem is, I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. That's when Elaine Peterson went missing. Elaine was an older lady, lived on her own about five miles down the road, known for her apple pies and her sharp tongue. When she didn't show up at the community potluck, folks figured she was sick, and some of the ladies went to check on her. Place was empty. No sign of Elaine, but there was a mess. Like someone had torn through the place, looking for something. Sheriff Ellis started an investigation, asked a lot of questions, but there weren't no cameras out there, barely any folks even had cell service. Elaine just vanished. Now, I don't believe in ghost stories and all that, but there's something about a missing person, an empty house. Sends a chill through you. Folks started talking about some half-remembered tale of a wild man up in the hills, and I'll admit, my own mind started seeing shadows in the twilight. I got tougher about protecting my livestock. Fixed up the chicken coop, made sure the goat's pen was secure, and started bringing them into the barn at night. Found myself scanning the tree lean more, shotgun getting a regular cleaning. But the worst was the nights. Those sounds would start up, the rustling, the growls, just far enough away to set me on edge, close enough that sleep became a memory. Then one morning, I found a chicken carcass. Or what was left of it. Not torn up like a predator kill, but drained. Almost like something had sucked it dry. My stomach twisted. I dug a hole, buried the poor thing, and then something just snapped in me. Went to town, 
bought every heavy-duty motion-activated light I could find, plus a trail camera. I was rigging that stuff up like a war zone, ignoring the worried looks from old Mrs. Beasley at the general store. Finally finished around dusk, stood back to admire my work. Figured if something big was lurking, I'd know soon enough. Night fell, heavy and thick. The lights flicked on as critters moved through the yard, which at least told me they were working. But as the hours wore on, that cold dread settled deep in my bones. Because even with the yard lit up like a football field, those sounds were still there, out in the shadows. The rustling, the growling, closer than before. Then the lights flickered and went out. Plunged the whole farm into darkness. And I saw it. Not clearly, thank God. Just a silhouette against the dim starlight, towering over the barn. Massive shoulders, a long snout, eyes that caught the faint light and glowed a sickly yellow. It stood there, watching the house for what felt like forever. Then, it turned and slinked back towards the trees on paws that padded silently across the hard earth. I was frozen, barely breathing. Shotgun was back in the house, useless against whatever that was. I thought of Elaine Peterson, of that torn up house, and something in me went cold. In the first light of dawn, I hitched up the trailer and loaded what I could fit in my old truck. Folks in town, they gave me those pitying looks as I packed up. I didn't say nothing about what happened, just muttered about the farm being too much work. They nodded, clucking their tongues. Probably think I lost my nerve, just another city boy who couldn't cut it. Maybe they're right. I don't much care. Took some back roads out of there, driving until the mountains faded in the rearview mirror. Found myself a cheap apartment in Chattanooga, got a job with a landscaping crew. City life ain't so bad. After all, leastwise, there aren't things out at the edge of your vision, disappearing into the dark. Most nights, I sleep like the dead. But sometimes, sometimes I wake up with my heart pounding, and I hear that low growl, like a rumble of thunder on a clear day. I check the locks on my windows, lay awake staring at the shadows cast by the street lights and wonder if someday those yellow eyes will be staring back at me. This happened to me a few years back, when I was a fishing guide up in Alaska. Wild, beautiful country, if you can stomach the cold and the isolation. Figured it was a good way to make a living after some rough patches back in the lower 48. Got good at it too, knew the rivers and lakes like the back of my hand. My name's Jake, by the way, Jake Tanner. Had some regulars among my clients. There was this one group, three guys, came up every summer from California for some serious fishing and roughing it. Bankers or stockbrokers, the type with money to burn. Loud, like to brag. Treated me more like hired help than a guide, but they tipped well. I'd put up with a lot for a good payday. That particular summer, they wanted something different. They'd heard tales about a remote lake way up north, supposed to have monster trout, but hard to get to. Figured this was their chance to show off, come back with some whopper of a story. I warned them, the terrain was rough. No trails, not even marked on most maps. They just grinned, offered to throw in an extra bonus. Against my better judgment, I agreed. Couple of days later, we flew out in a bush plane, the kind that lands on anything vaguely resembling a flat surface. Pilot didn't like the look of the place, 
muttered something about bad vibes as he dropped us off on a narrow stretch of rocky beach and took off in a cloud of spray. He left us a sat phone for emergencies and a grumbled, good luck, as he disappeared into the overcast sky. The guys were in high spirits at first, snapping pictures, cracking jokes about conquering the wilderness. We set off, me in the lead, them hauling backpacks they'd probably paid more for than my truck. I soon realized why no sane person visited this place. It was a slog, dense thickets, boggy patches that sucked at your boots, and mosquitoes thick as smoke. By nightfall, we'd made pathetically little progress, and the guys were starting to whine. Next morning was even worse. The air was heavy, oppressive, with a stillness that didn't feel right. The guys got quieter, their city swagger fading with every mile. That nagging feeling I'd been trying to ignore sunk its claws in deeper. We weren't alone out here. Not exactly unseen, but watched. I'd catch glimpses of movement out of the corner of my eye, hear rustles that didn't match any critter I knew. Late on the third day, as we struggled up a steep, brushy slope, it happened. One of the guys, Trevor, let out a strangled yell. I whipped around to see him stumbling, clawing at his leg. There was blood, and something thick and dark was oozing out of a gash in his calf. It wasn't a bear trap, or a hidden root, those gashes were claw marks, long and deep. Trevor went down hard, screaming. That's when we saw it emerge from the brush. Easily seven feet tall, hunched over on powerful legs. Its dense fur was a grizzled mix of brown and gray, and those eyes, yellow, gleaming with a cold intelligence that sent chills down my spine. The head was wolfish, but the snout was too long, the teeth, wrong. Jesus, one of the other guys whimpered, fumbling in his pack. My voice stuck in my throat as I thought of the rifle I'd foolishly left back at camp. We'd been so focused on bears and moose that I never would have. Run. I managed to yell. We scattered, pure instinct taking over. Behind us, the creature roared, an unearthly sound that tore through the deathly quiet. I heard another scream cut off abruptly and replaced by a wet, tearing sound that made me want to retch. I didn't look back, just ran, branches tearing at my clothes, heart pounding like a drum gone mad. Finally, I stumbled out onto a patch of open ground. Gasping for breath, I looked around wildly, the trees a swirling blur. I was alone. For hours, I stumbled onward, driven by blind panic and the certainty that whatever was back there was hunting me. I thought of Trevor, and the other guy, what was left of them. The image flashed in my mind, forcing its way past the barriers of shock and horror. Eventually, I tripped over a root and collapsed, sobs tearing through me. I lay there on the forest floor the cold seeping into my bones, waiting for the creature to close in and finish the job. But it didn't come. As the light started to fade, the noises of the forest slowly returned. Bird calls, the rustling of small animals, the normal sounds that underscored the unnatural quiet of this cursed place. I forced myself to move, found the sat phone, hands shaking so badly I could barely dial. I babbled something to the bewildered pilot about an accident, about needing an immediate evac. It took agonizing hours before the drone of the plane's engine finally broke through the silence. When the pilot saw my face, wild-eyed and streaked with mud and blood, he didn't ask questions, just got me out of there. The aftermath was a blur. Police, 
park rangers, some guys in suits who didn't give their agency. They searched the area, found no sign of the other two guys, no creature. Just Trevor's mangled backpack and a story nobody believed. They wrote it off as a bear attack, freak accident. Me, I got branded a traumatized, unreliable witness, maybe even someone looking to make a buck by inventing some outlandish story. I spent the next months in a haze, the nightmares worse than any wilderness ordeal. Lost my guide license, reputation shot. Drifting from one dead-end job to the next, I finally ended up in this rundown motel in Nevada. Nowhere to go, nobody who cares, and nothing left to lose. Sometimes, late at night, I open a dusty atlas and trace my finger along the wild, unmarked parts of Alaska. I wonder if it is still out there, lurking in the shadows of that desolate lake, waiting for some other fool to stumble into its territory. And every once in a while, when the wind howls outside my window, I think I hear another roar echoing in the emptiness, a sound that promises a brutal death in the forgotten corners of the world. This happened to me a few years back, when I was a fishing guide up in Maine. Spent my high school summers working on the coast, knew those woods and inlets like the back of my hand. After college, with no better plan in sight, I figured I'd turn my hobby into a living. Name's Alex, by the way, Alex Grant. First couple of years were great. Had a steady stream of clients, city folk wanting to escape the rat race, rich guys on expense accounts, the occasional outdoorsy couple. It wasn't glamorous, but the pay was enough, and I loved being out on the water. Lived in a small town, Bar Harbor, the kind of place where everyone knows everyone. Spent my evenings at the local pub, swapping stories with the regulars. That was when I met Eileen Walker. Eileen was about 10 years older, a science teacher from Boston on a solo summer trip. She wasn't like my usual clientele, not much for small talk. We got to chatting one evening after a particularly tough fishing day. Something about her, the sharp mind, the dry humor, it drew me in. We ended up talking for hours. Before I knew it, the bar was closing. We kept meeting up, fishing trips turning into long hikes, then dinners at hole-in-the-wall diners. I guess by then it was obvious to everyone but me and Eileen, we were falling for each other. When her vacation ended, we couldn't stay in the distance. She found a teaching job near Bar Harbor, and soon enough we were sharing my cramped little apartment. Life, for once, felt pretty damn perfect. That's when the disappearances started. First it was Tommy Perkins, a teenager who worked at the marina. Kid was always a bit of a loner, spent most of his free time exploring the coastal trails folks figured he'd just run off, a small town boy itching for adventure. But then others vanished, Mr. Rossi, the old baker who never missed his evening walk, a young couple out camping on the island. There was no pattern, no connection between the missing. The police did their best, put up search parties, interviewed anyone who'd seen anything remotely suspicious. But there was nothing. No witnesses, no evidence, just people disappearing into thin air the town started to hum with unease. People locked their doors, kept their kids indoors, and cast wary eyes at any stranger passing through. Eileen and I, we tried to ignore it for as long as possible. Snuck in hikes when we could, pretended that the fear hanging over Bar Harbor wasn't seeping into our own lives. But it was getting harder to deny the whispers, 
the rumors of strange sightings out in the woods, things just beyond the corner of your eye. On a rainy afternoon, the day it all changed, Eileen was grading papers at the kitchen table. I was cleaning my gear, trying to ignore the pit of dread in my gut. A sound came from outside the window, a thump, heavier than the dripping branches. Eileen looked up, startled. Probably just a deer, I muttered, trying to convince myself. We stared at the dripping bushes outside. Then, there was another sound, more like a rustling this time. Suddenly, Eileen let out a sharp gasp. I followed her gaze to the window. There, just visible through the leaves, was a shape. Large, crouched low. I couldn't make out all the details, but I saw enough. It was massive, at least seven feet tall even hunched over. Dark, matted fur clung to its powerful frame. Its eyes glowed amber, reflecting the dim light, filled with a hunger that turned my blood to ice. It was watching us. For a frozen moment, neither of us spoke. Then, as if sensing our gaze, the creature turned its head slightly. The snout was long and wolf-like, but the jaw was wrong. Too wide, the teeth too long and sharp. It took a single slow step towards the house, then vanished back into the undergrowth. No, Eileen whispered, her eyes saucer-wide, face pale. No, that can't be. Her voice was shaking. I didn't know what to say. All my years in the wilderness, all the tales I'd dismissed as local folklore, suddenly felt sickeningly real. We have to tell someone, I said finally. My voice sounded weak, even to myself. We called the sheriff's office, but it was the same as before. They came, did a cursory search, found nothing. I could see the doubt in their eyes, the unspoken judgment that we were just another pair of spooked locals. Later that night, I sat on the porch, rifle across my lap, feeling both ridiculously brave and utterly useless. The next few weeks passed in a blur of sleepless nights and patrols around my property. It became impossible to step into the woods without feeling eyes on my back. Eileen and I clung to each other, a desperate bid for comfort in the face of the unknown. One morning, I woke to an empty bed. Eileen's car was gone, along with a hastily scrawled note on the kitchen counter. I'm sorry, Alex. I can't do this anymore. I can't live with this fear. It's safer not knowing. My world shattered into a million pieces as I read those words. Fury mixed with a bone-deep ache, but deep down, I understood. Then came the gut-wrenching certainty. I had to leave Bar Harbor too. I packed my things that night, the familiar cabin walls closing in on me. Before dawn, I drove out of town and didn't look back. It's been a year or so. I drift from place to place, never staying long. Work odd jobs, camp in national forests, try to lose myself in the vastness of the country. Still, every time I'm out in the wilderness, every rustle or snap of a twig, I feel those amber eyes boring into me. Sometimes, I see reports on the news, another disappearance, another sighting of something strange out in the main woods. Sometimes, I swear I see Eileen's face in a crowded bar, disappearing into the throng before I can reach her. This happened to me a few years back, just another camping trip with my buddies up in the Adirondack Mountains. I'm Wes, by the way, and I've always been more of a city guy. 
but they somehow always talked me into roughing it with them. This time, they wanted to go deep, somewhere hardly anyone else ever strayed. I wasn't exactly thrilled with that concept, but I packed my gear and headed out anyway. The first two days weren't so bad. The trail was clear enough, the weather was decent, and we were making good time. Sure, the woods felt a bit thicker, a bit darker up here than other trails we'd done, but they were my buddies. We'd joke, bust each other's chops, it almost felt normal. It wasn't until the third day things started to feel off. Maybe it was just the isolation finally setting in. I woke up to a strange silence. No birds, no rustling of small critters, just this eerie quiet. We broke camp, but as we hiked, that feeling just intensified. Around midday, we crossed a small stream. That's when I saw it. Right in the mud of the stream bank, one gigantic paw print, way bigger than even a bear. The claws were massive. The guys thought it was hilarious, started joking about Bigfoot or something. But I couldn't shake the sense of something watching us from further back in the trees. We pressed on, the sunlight barely filtering through the canopy. Then we heard it, a howl unlike anything I've ever heard before, long and mournful, echoing off the hillsides. The guys froze. They finally seemed to get that something wasn't right. We made camp early. There was no way any of us could keep hiking after that. That night, the woods were anything but silent. Rustling sounds, almost like footsteps circling our tents. Branches snapping, way too heavy an animal to be some deer. And, occasionally, that howl again, each time seeming closer. It felt like a siege. Morning finally came. We wasted no time getting packed up, that feeling of unease ratcheted up to a near panic. Just as we were about to hike out, there was movement in the trees. Two enormous figures stepped out, wolves, but bigger than any I'd seen in nature photos. Their heads reached my chest, even on all fours. And the way they stood, somehow so, wrong. The panic hit then, pure and raw. We turned and ran, just scattered, no plan or direction. I could hear my buddies screaming behind me, some shouting, some sobbing, but I didn't look back. I crashed through the underbrush, branches whipping past terror my only guide. Then I stumbled into a clearing, face planting onto the carpet of pine needles. I lay there, heaving, waiting for those monstrous wolves to catch up and tear me to pieces. Instead, I heard a voice. Human. Older man, with a hint of amusement, saying, well, look what the cat dragged in. I scrambled up, looked around wildly. A man in faded camo stood next to a half-hidden shack. In his hands, a rifle big enough to bring down a moose. He pointed it down the path I'd just run from. Those things ever been a problem around here? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. He looked at me, a glint in his eyes. Oh, they've been around a while. They like their territory, them ones. Don't take too kindly to folks wandering in. What, what are they? I finally stammered out. He shrugged, grin wide like I'd told a joke. People hereabouts got a name for em. You ever hear of dogmen? My mind raced through those nature docks I'd half-watched, stories my buddies dismissed as campfire tales, it couldn't be real. Yet, part of me knew it was. Guess you're lucky then, the old man said, turning back towards the shack, they don't often leave witnesses. 
that's when I saw it. Slinking back into the trees, a massive canine head, eyes like smoldering coals, watching me. Then it was gone. We ran. That old man shouting directions at me, cursing under his breath about me being a fool to come out here. He kept that rifle pointed out the whole time, like the trees themselves would spring to life and snatch us. Eventually, after what felt like an eternity, we stumbled out onto a dirt road. The old man finally lowered the rifle, pointed a gnarled finger down the road. Hitch your ride out of here. And don't you go wandering back into the deeps. They might not be so forgiving next time. I turned to thank him, but he was gone, faded back into the woods like a ghost. I flagged down the first car I saw. Never looked back. My buddies? I never saw them again. Search parties found nothing. Officially, the story is animal attack, maybe a hidden bear den. Whatever it was, the authorities don't want to find out. And me? I stay in the city where it's safe. But at night, when I hear a siren wail, it sounds an awful lot like a howl. This happened to me a few years back, when I was working as a ranch hand out in Wyoming. Beautiful country but lonely if you're not used to that wide open space and the quiet that settles in at night. Always been a city boy at heart, but after I lost my job, well, any works better than none. My name's Wyatt, by the way, Wyatt Holden. Bossman, old Ray Cooper, was a tough son of a gun. Ran his herd with an iron fist, expected the same from his workers. I'd mostly kept to myself, done my job, but one thing always irked me. Ray had a big German Shepherd named Blitz, meanest dog I'd ever seen. He'd keep Blitz penned up during work hours, but at night, that animal roamed free, guarding the property. Figure that was standard for an isolated ranch, but sometimes, I'd hear Blitz barking like mad out in the darkness way past where any coyote would wander. Life went on like that for a couple of months. Then the disappearances started. First, it was just a sheep or two, which Ray blamed on mountain lions. But soon, it got worse. A whole calf vanished overnight, no carcass, no blood trail, nothing. When another calf went missing a week later, folks started talking. Ray got real quiet, a haunted look in his eyes. I guess even tough old ranchers get spooked sometimes. He started doubling up on night patrols, and that's when I got dragged into it. One cold, clear night, we were riding the fence line when we heard it a howl that made the hair on my neck stand up. It wasn't a coyote, not a wolf either. This was, deeper, longer, a mournful kind of sound that echoed against the distant hills. Something ain't right, Ray muttered, his hand tightening on his rifle. Blitz, usually brave as anything, was whimpering at his feet. We followed the sound, our horses moving slow and cautious. The moon cast long, eerie shadows, and the howl came again, closer this time. As we crested a ridge, I saw it. Standing in a moonlit clearing, it was massive, at least seven feet tall on its hind legs. Its fur was a tangled mess of black, matted with God knows what. The head was lupin, the jaw too long, filled with wicked teeth. But it was the eyes that got me, they glowed a hateful yellow, reflecting the moonlight. The next moments are a blur. Ray shouted, his rifle barked, and the creature snarled a bone-chilling snarl that wasn't quite animal. 
It lunged towards us, faster than anything that size had a right to be. I kicked my horse into a run, blind panic taking over. Behind me, I heard Ray cry out, a strangled yell cut short. Then came the unmistakable sound of gunfire, Blitz's frantic barks, and another snarl, filled with rage and pain. I didn't stop riding until I reached the ranch house. Burst through the door, babbling something about a monster, about Ray. Found the other hands inside, their faces grim. They told me Ray hadn't made it back. Told me they'd heard the whole thing over the radio, the gunshots, the screams. Next morning, a search party went out. They found the clearing, found blood splattered across the rocks. A tuft of coarse black fur snagged down a bush, a single, massive paw print pressed into the mud. They never found Ray's body. I left that ranch the same day, didn't look back. Told myself it was a freak accident, a bear or some unknown predator gone rogue. But in my nightmares, I still see those yellow eyes, feel that inhuman gaze on me in the darkness. I got a job tending bar in Denver now. It's noisy, crowded, the furthest thing from the lonely Wyoming range. Sometimes though, late at night when the bar empties out, I think I hear the echo of a mournful howl carried on the wind. One night, I swear, I saw a massive, hunched figure slip down the alleyway outside. I blinked, and it was gone. Probably just a stray dog, my mind playing tricks after one whiskey too many. But that flicker of doubt lingers, a cold shiver crawling down my spine. Couple of weeks ago, I saw a news report, another rancher in Wyoming gone missing, under eerily familiar circumstances. It sent a chill through me. Seemed that whatever lurks at the edge of the wildlands, whatever haunted the dark spaces where the shadows grow long, it was still hungry. The boss brought in a new bartender the other night, young guy, fresh from the rural heartland. Looking at him, I saw myself a few years back, that same mix of grit and naivety. I wanted to warn him, tell him about the things you can't explain, that lurk just beyond the city lights. Before I could find the words, a couple of rowdy customers called for drinks. I turned away, busying myself with wiping down glasses. The look on that kid's face as he headed toward them was hopeful, eager, ready to start his life in the big city. Maybe ignorance is a blessing sometimes. This happened to me a few years ago, down in Louisiana. Been into the outdoors ever since I was a little kid, fishing on the bayou behind my grandma's place helping my uncle on a shrimp boat. After my wife passed, well, let's just say I needed a change of scenery. Name's Harlan, Harlan DuPont. Figured, with my experience, I could start a guide business for swamp tours. Show those city folks the true heart of the bayou, the kind you don't see from Bourbon Street balconies. Rented an old, flat-bottomed boat, set myself up a little website, started drumming up business. Tourists turned out to love it. The gators, the cypress trees dripping moss, the whole spooky Cajun vibe of the place, they ate it up. Most days were smooth sailing, easy money for showing folks a piece of the world I knew like my own backyard. Then came the Reynold family. Four of them, a rich-looking couple in matching polo shirts, their two teenage kids glued to their phones. Right from the start, something about them rubbed me wrong. They didn't seem all that interested in the sights. Instead, they whispered to each other, pointed at the thickets on the shoreline. The daughter kept giggling, 
the son wore the smug smirk on his face. Even the dad, with his pressed khakis and shiny sunglasses, kept shooting me uneasy glances. Halfway through the tour, the son piped up, Hey, old man, heard stories about some big hairy monster out here. What you know about that? I shrugged, played it cool. Just old wives' tales, son. Trying to scare the little kids, that's all. But the daughter wasn't buying it. Come on, everyone knows about the Rogaru, she said, with that teenage know-it-all voice. Now, the Rogaru, that's an old Louisiana legend. Cajun boogeyman, some say a werewolf creature, stalks the swamps and preys on the lost, the foolish. I ain't superstitious, but growing up, there's always that tinge of fear that hangs in the air, especially when you're out in the bayou alone at night. Tried to brush them off, told them some alligator stories instead. The dad, though, he'd gotten real quiet. Kept staring at the dense swampland like he expected something to leap out. When it was nearly time to turn back, the Reynold family insisted on going further, deeper into the maze of waterways. Pushed it right up until the sun was starting to dip below the tree lean. Just a little further, the dad practically begged. Sweat was beaded on his forehead, even though the air was getting cooler. I didn't like the desperation in his eyes. Against my better judgment, I agreed. Figured if anything, it'd shut them up. That's when we saw it. Not the Rogaru, at least not at first. We turned a bend in the channel, and there was an old shack, half sunk in the mud. Didn't look like any trapper's cabin I'd ever seen. The wood was blackened, the roof half caved in, and a sickly kind of smell hung around it. Before I could turn the boat around, the son shouted, Hey, look! He was pointing at the bank near the shack. At first, all I saw were shadows, the fading light playing tricks. Then, they moved. Three figures, massive, hunched, almost blending into the undergrowth. But as they slinked closer, I saw them with horrible clarity. They were easily seven feet tall when they stood upright, covered in mangy, dark fur. Their snouts were long, filled with wicked teeth, and their eyes, those eyes shone a vicious yellow in the twilight. One of them let out a low rumbling growl that sent a chill straight through me. Rougarou. The daughter shrieked, finally dropping her phone. The parents were pale as ghosts, the dad fumbling for something in his pocket. I didn't wait to find out what he was grabbing. Gun the boat's engine, lurched us back down the channel. Behind us, I heard the creatures snarl and the awful sound of them splashing into the water, giving chase. We tore through that swamp, the Reynolds family screaming all the while. Must have been pure luck, or maybe some old Cajun spirit watching over me, that we found our way back into the main waterway as darkness fell. Sped toward the dock, the creature's growls fading in the distance. I never saw that family again. They left the next morning without a word, not even a thank you. I like to think their fancy clothes and money didn't do them much good against what lives out there. Me, I sold the boat a week later. Some parts of the swamp, they're best left unseen. Best left alone. Nowadays, I stick to the city, work as a handyman, keep my head down. Every once in a while, though, I catch a whiff of that swampy smell, a smell of mud and rot and something that ain't quite natural. And at night, sometimes at night, I hear a low growl echoing in my nightmares, and those yellow eyes flash in the dark.
This happened to me a few years back. I still think about it sometimes. It was a typical Midwestern summer, hot, humid, the kind of weather that makes it feel like time itself slows down. Me and my buddies, Rustin and Xylan, were bored. Small towns breed boredom better than they breed anything else. We spent most days biking the back roads, playing basketball at the park, or venturing into the woods behind Rustin's house. That particular day we were down by the old creek. Rustin found a dead bird, some kind of warbler, half-eaten and missing most of its feathers. Xylan started teasing him, acting like he was gonna throw it. I told them to knock it off, but when you're young and dumb, a little teasing never really stops, does it? We heard a noise. Didn't sound natural. A kind of grunting snarl, low and guttural. We froze. There was another, closer, coming from the bushes deeper in the trees. I made eye contact with Xylan. His face had gone white. Rustin still held the bird in his hand, acting tough. I swear, some guys get stupider when they're scared. From the brush, it emerged. At first, it looked like a huge dog on two legs. Massive shoulders, long snout filled with rows of yellow pointed teeth. But its hair was wrong, a patchy dark brown, clumping in greasy tufts over sinewy muscle. Its eyes were human-like, filled with a cold intelligence I'd never seen in an animal before. Claws, not paws, tipped those long forelegs. Then it charged. Xylan screamed. We scattered. Rustin still held that stupid bird, staring in shock as the thing closed the distance in seconds. I yelled at him to throw it, but he didn't. His eyes widened. The creature took him in one leap. There was a crunch, a spray of blood. Then it vanished back into the trees with Rustin in its jaws. I heard him scream, high and thin until it just cut off. Xylan sobbed. I pushed him to his feet. We have to run. Now! I grabbed his arm and dragged him, kicking and screaming about Rustin. All I could think about was getting out of those woods. We didn't stop until we reached the edge of town. Collapsed on the sidewalk, we gasped for breath. I forced myself to look back towards the woods, nothing. Xylan, we gotta tell someone, I panted. He shook his head, tears streaming. They won't believe us. They'll think we're crazy. I had no answer. My own brain struggled to grasp what I'd just witnessed. An animal that big, that smart, it wasn't right. Xylan stood up, brushing dirt from his knees. I'm gonna tell them he ran away. Please, don't say anything. I should have argued. Should have called the cops, even knowing it'd sound insane. But I was scared too. Of what the cops would say, of what everyone would think of me, of going back into those woods. I nodded, and the lie was formed. They searched for Rustin, of course. News crews came for a week or two, stirred up a fuss, but found nothing. His parents, God... I couldn't look them in the eye. Xylan shut down. Didn't speak much for months after. Years later, I still bike those back roads sometimes. I keep my eyes on the trees. Rustin's face flashes before me, that frozen look of shock before the darkness took him. I wonder, every time, if the thing is still out there. Wonder if I'll ever forget the sound of his scream cutting off. There are reports, whispers in other towns, other states. 
missing people, sightings of something monstrous in the shadows. Sometimes I search online, late at night, looking for any hint he wasn't the only one. It's never enough, never enough to know the truth of what happened that day. Me and Xylan, we don't talk about it. Sometimes we pass each other in the grocery store or stop to chat for a few minutes. He's got a family, now. Kids will never know his old friend the way I did. We make small talk about the weather, our jobs, normal stuff. We never mention the woods, or that summer, or the sound of bones breaking under those monstrous teeth. We moved on, like people do. The town eventually forgot, like towns always do. But I remember. And I always look over my shoulder. Because what if, one day, I catch a glimpse in the trees, eyes glinting in the dark? What if they come for me next?